try going to town to sneak out of your house to go to the grocery store and running into the judge at Kroger's. So about 30 minutes go by and I call him, he doesn't answer. And then about another 10 minutes go by and he calls me back and he's like, Hey man, I wouldn't park down there at that gas station where you met me. He's like, a lot of cops have been driving by there lately. And I thought, that's a weird thing to say. You know what I mean? Like, why would you say that? So once they heard that, they then wanted me to also get that guy on and wire. I didn't get a chance to tell you about the Mexican girl that I flew here from Mexico that I had never met in person before. Why did you? Why did you fly her in? That's a whole story, bro. You you, you hear it? Yeah. Okay. How and yes, I am loyal. Fuck that guy that I wore a wire. On. Like. <laughs> Hey, this is Matt Cox, and I am here with Jax. He is a he is a recovering uh, addict and former felon. And so, so this is uh, we've been talking on the phone and texting. And uh, he told me a story, and I thought it was pretty interesting. So I asked him if he'd come on the program. So check this out. Hey guys, how you doing? Um, all right. So I mean, I, I know we heard. It's funny because when we talked, you. We talked and you were like, I don't know if it's, you know, I, I don't know how much, you know, I can talk about it and how much of a story it was. And then like 45 minutes later, yeah, I'm like, well, if, if some of you doesn't have a story, you talked for 45 minutes about the story. Yeah. Or told me portions of it. So yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, so tell, talk to me, tell me about like, where were you born? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so basically I, I, I'm from Ohio. Um, you know, uh, I was born in Ohio. Uh, I've been here my whole life. Um, I mean, I've, I've been lucky and gotten to travel around, but I was born here. Um, so I was born just, you know, in 1980. So 80s kid, you know what I mean? Uh, I'm 42 now. So, uh, you know, my parents, uh, I think had been married like 10 years uh, when they had me. And uh, then, you know, they got divorced. When I was five years old, um, which was a good thing, my dad was was a monster, you know, my real father, unfortunately. Um, and so he was, you know, cheating on my mother uh, behind her back. He was a uh, union pipe fitter. And so he traveled a lot for work, stuff like that. And so he was away in South Carolina working and uh, met this other woman who would become my stepmother and was cheating on my mom with her when he was down there. And so... You know, he um, basically came back, and it's kind of shitty. That's all I remember from my childhood, or at least that portion of it was the night that he left because I was there for all of it, for the screaming and the, you know, the whole kind of thing. And uh, I always found it really weird. I knew at five years old, like, what the word divorced meant because I heard my father say that to my mother, and, like, I knew what it meant. It was kind of weird because you're five. You know what I mean? Right. right. Um, so, and then, yeah, literally he... Um, that happened and then I woke up the next morning and he was gone. And so he never really wanted much to do with me. Um, I was lucky if I saw him once a year, you know, uh, after they got a divorce. And I'm an only child, so my father married the woman he was cheating with and she didn't have any kids. They didn't have any kids together. And then, um, you know, my mother uh, got remarried a couple years later to my to my now stepfather um and i got a stepbrother and two stepsisters out of it but my mom and my stepdad didn't have any kids together either so i'm like a legit only child right yeah so after the you know my dad left um he like said didn't want much to do with me didn't see him that often uh didn't really pay child support like my mom showed me records and like proof and stuff she wasn't just like trying to bash my dad like he was he was not the greatest guy Right. He had his own fucking issues. He drank alcoholism, runs in my family, horrible. Um, so bad to the point that my mother's father actually killed himself because of it, hung himself, which is a wild, which is a wild story in itself, like how it happened. He, um, I obviously way before I was born, but, uh, he was in World War II and, uh, came home and obviously had a bunch of issues. My, my, mother's father my grandfather and um so drank a lot and uh got picked up one night here in town 
by the police and uh, for like drunk and disorderly or something like that. And they put him in the holding cell and apparently it was cold. And so he asked if he could have his, like his coat, like his, he had like a trench coat or something. And he took the belt off the coat and hung himself in the cell. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So that's my mother's father. Yeah. So alcoholism runs on both sides, on my mother's side and my father's side, like, like horrible. You know, my last name is German and Welsh, so we got German in us, so there's plenty of drinkers in my family. They like beer. But I didn't go that route. I went the more chemical route. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was never big on beer. Uh, so anyway, my mom got remarried when I was seven to my stepfather, who um, honestly I really don't have that much in common with or get along with either, but he's good to my mother, and that's all I care about. Right. Um, so growing up, you know, I was very lucky. Come from a upper middle class home. My mother, um, especially after my father left, uh, great woman, very smart. Worked four jobs to take care of her and I before she met my stepfather. And like people hear that, and they go four jobs. Like what the fuck? And I'm like, yeah. She was a insurance agent for 45 years until she retired. She was the clerk treasurer at the local library, and she did books and payroll for two separate laundromats. So, like, my mom worked her ass off right. to take care of us. And uh, once my stepfather came in the picture, like I said, I all of a sudden had a stepbrother and two stepsisters. They were My sisters were older, so they didn't live with us, but I did all of a sudden have a brother that lived with us now, and now I'm growing up with a sibling in the house, which I wasn't used to before then. How old bro was your brother? He's, uh, he's a year older than me. So he's, okay. um, I'll be 43 this year. He's, uh, 44 right now. Yeah. So he's a year older. He graduated in 1998. I graduated in 99. We both went to the same high school. Um, so she married him and then, you know, things started to really get better after that. Like, uh, my stepfather had a really successful contracting business, very smart guy. Um, but a lot of the, I live in a small town, so a lot of the houses and things around here, he actually built different businesses, things like that. And um, so, yeah, growing up, uh, we were very lucky. We had My parents made good money. We traveled, you know, anything you would probably want it to be from a, a childhood standpoint. Good Christmases, things like that. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, which makes no sense for the path that I chose because I didn't belong in that fucking world at all. I was a horrible drug dealer, which we'll get to. <laughs> I was terrible with a drug dealer. I just wanted to party. Like, I was terrible at it. Uh, so, you know, growing up and then pretty much just like anybody else's life, man, uh, going to school, going to high school. Um, like I said, my stepbrother and I now, I had a brother um, who stuck up for me. I got picked on a lot in school. Um, I was a very heavy set kid when I was younger. I was, I was a fat kid and, uh, I got fucked with a lot. I got picked on a lot. And, uh, so when I got to high school, uh, Pete, I started to thin out a little bit, but he, um, he was good about that. He always made sure nobody messed with me and shit. He really kind of watched my back, even though he wasn't my real brother. So I was always thankful for that. Um, and then, so I graduated in 99 and about a year and a half, I think it was almost two years after I graduated, I had um, kind of basically took a year off and I started to go to, uh, to college in Nelsonville, Ohio, the place called Hawking. It's a, like a technical type school. It's um, close to OU University, which is, you know, uh, Ohio University, not to be confused with OSU. Um, but I uh, didn't really have the grades to get into OU. You know what I mean? I was... In high school, I had, I had to take a lot of special classes and stuff. I have learning disabilities and shit. I'm really hyper. <laughs> I've got ADD and all that kind of shit. Like, I was on meds from a very young age. Um, so, I decided to try to go to college. And uh, so, I'd been in school really only for about a semester and got diagnosed with cancer. And so, I'm only 20 years old. You know what I mean? Right. I forgot about that. That's yeah. Right. And so it was really crazy how it happened. I um, went to my my family doctor for something just completely unrelated, just like a normal uh, doctor's appointment. And I had this mole on the inside of my right leg, and it had been there, you know, forever. And just that day, he happened to say, you know, I don't like the look of that. He's like, I want to cut that off. And I'm like, all right. 
And so he numbs my leg and all of a sudden I'm awake when he does it and he, you know, he cuts around it and pulls the mole off. And like, I saw the look on his face when he did it, like when he pulled the mole off of my leg, like it had all these tentacles and stuff growing like off of it, like connected to everything in my leg. Right. And of course they won't tell you shit when they do that. They've got to biopsy it. You know what I mean? Right. So about a week and a half later, I was, I remember, I'll never forget. I was in the car with my mom. Now this is like early 2000s still. So we had uh, actual car phones for all you kids out there. We had phones that had cords on them in the fucking car. If you can imagine. Yeah. Shocking. <laughs> and, uh, I was in the car with my mom and the phone rang and, uh, it was my doctor and he said, look, we've taken care of everything on our end. You need to get to OSU hospital immediately to get into surgery. You know, you have cancer and it's spreading at an aggressive rate. And so within a few hours, I was in uh, the hospital in Columbus uh, at OSU, which is one of the best cancer hospitals in the country, actually. And uh, had to have an epidural like a pregnant woman, like where they stick the big thing in your back and numb you from the waist down and like basically took a huge like chunk out of the inside of my right leg from the knee down. Like when the surgery was done, it looked like a shark took a half moon bite out of the inside of my leg. Right. And that's how much they had to cut out to try to get all of the cancer. And then it had also spread to like the lymph nodes in my right leg. So they had to remove the ones out of my groin and like all that shit. It was brutal. I was 20 years old. Scary. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it, uh, so, you know, I had to have all that done. And like I said, it, it was wild, man. And, um, did you have to chemo? Yeah, I did. I did a couple rounds of that just as like a, to, to make sure, you know, that they did got everything. They, they said that the margins were really good when they cut it out. They were pretty positive, but they wanted to just make sure, cause I was so young, you know what I mean? To have that. Basically they told me this mole, the growth rate had, it had accelerated 20 years in the course of three months. That's how much it had spread. That's how fast malignant melanomas grow, which is what kind of cancer it was. If I didn't mention it, it was malignant melanoma. And uh, so got very lucky though. I beat it, um, made it over the five-year hump, um, you know, but that is what really started my downfall into just everything addiction and uh, whatever. You know, if you remember at the time, you know, 2000 2001 there was no such thing as like a pill epidemic there was no anything like that man doctors were just handing that shit out like tic tacs you know you could you could go to an emergency room and get 20 percocets like i mean just as easy as tripping and falling off the fucking curb like it was just you know what i mean and so because of the cancer and the surgery they were prescribing me i was getting oxycontin i was getting percocet for like breakthrough pain i was getting um you know, value to help me sleep. It was ridiculous. And so I'd never been on any medication like that before. I'd never, you know, up until this point, the most I'd ever done is smoke a joint. You know what I mean? Just with like some friends in high school. Right. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. So all of a sudden I'm on all this medication and like I'm getting hammered basically every day, like fucked up. You know what I mean? And, uh, so after the surgery, I had started working at a telemarketing place and <laughs> this place, dude, it, I mean, you couldn't have put a drug, an addict in a worse in fuck environment. Like, you know, it just was, that's all the kind of people that work there. Like everybody was railing Percocets in the bathroom and like, it was just madness and talking on the phone. Right. But you still were being prescribed the medication. Yes. At that right. point. Yeah, at that point, I was still being prescribed the meds, but then just working there, of course, that's what people found out I was on the meds. And people were like, well, let me buy a couple of those off of you. And I'm like, all right, you know, I mean, I'm not going to turn down 20 bucks or whatever it is. And so that started, you know, that whole thing. Now, as I'm working there at this telemarketing place, <clears throat> I'm on the meds and uh, this new guy gets hired. And uh, I, I won't say his last name, but his name was Josh. And him and I kind of became really fast friends. And, um, you know, back then I was, I was still smoking weed as well. You know, I was taking these prescription pills. And so, uh, you know, Josh and I started hanging out. And he started asking me, you know, can you, can you get any weed? You know, stuff like that. And I'm like, I'm like yeah. And I, there was a guy that worked there that, you know, I could get 
killer weed from, you know, as much as I wanted, really. And so I started getting this guy, Josh, weed. Well, come to find out, he was an undercover cop. And so, uh, you know, one night I was, I had left work and I got a phone call from him and he's like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm a town such and such, you know, meet me here. And when I pulled up, I got sworn by police, you know, and I had like, a, I think a quarter ounce of weed on me or something, but I, I had, that he had been buying this weed for me. And even I was getting it for him, even though I wasn't, I guess you would say the distributor or whatever. I had to go to someone else to get it. But so they called me up to the police station, man. And, you know, basically I'm what 21 at this point and read me the fucking riot act, scared the shit out of me. Like do this or you're going to jail, you know, that whole thing. And, um, so I did, man. So they asked me to wire up and, and fucking, and get this. They wanted the guy that was, you know, giving me the weed. And once they found out who that was, they realized that okay. this is the guy at the, this is the guy that one of the guys that works at the telemarketing oh, place. He had been, he had been placed there on purpose as an undercover cop because they had heard locally how much drug dealing and shit was going on there. Okay. Now. Okay. I, I understand. That. Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. So he got a job there because they put him there. Yeah, sorry if I didn't specify that. So they have me, you know, I agree to it because I don't want to go to jail. I'm 20 fucking years old. At this point, I'm still scared. Like, don't let my mom find out. You know what I mean? Like, you're a kid. You're a fucking kid. Like, you're like, don't tell my parents. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. So uh, I do what they want, but in the process of that, they found out that the guy that I was getting weed from, his father-in-law was actually one of the biggest drug dealers in our county. And that's who, he, this kid that I was getting the weed from, that's who he was getting it from, was his father. And so once they heard that, they then wanted me to also get that guy on fucking wire. And I'd never even met this man, you know what I mean? Like, I have no... Right. idea yeah how do you even get to that guy right so that i have to basically start hanging out with the guy that i got the the weed from be make friends with him to the point where i was buying enough where he finally took me straight to the fucking source and then i was able to go there a couple times and then yeah and then they ended up all... go ahead do you do you, remember, you you told me like the uh the, the equipment that they gave you oh god Oh God, dude! So like, it, it wasn't like a small little little thing you stuck. Listen, dude, for you kids out there that watch the show The Wire on HBO or anything like that, man, gee, listen, this is early two thousand. This is fucking analog technology. Okay, this thing I shit you not was the size of this cigarette pack right here. Okay, like it was half the size of this, and basically that's what it was. It was a soft pack of marlboro light cigarettes 100s and they had pulled all the cigarettes out of the pack stuck this thing in and, and pushed it off to the side and then filled the pack back up with cigarettes and like that was it so then they would have a truck you know like which was so cliche man like any movie you've ever seen it was like an old fucking chevy panel van that they worked out of you know what i mean and uh it, you can picture the guys inside with the microphone yes yeah and, and, and it was wheels oh yeah they checked levels and all of that shit dude they it was so stupid and um so you know you had to have this cigarette pack on you and i'll never forget one time one of the guys because i smoke obviously but i didn't have my own cigarettes i'd left them in the car or something and i went in to get some weed and the guy asked me for a cigarette I couldn't imagine how fucking stale and old these Marlboro lights were. And I I remember pulling this pack out and being like, oh, God, please don't let this guy see inside this fucking pack. And, like, gave him one of these, and he smoked it. He never said a word. I thought, that could not have fucking tasted good, bro. Like, how old is this Marlboro? You know what I mean? Like, right. it was dust at that point. He just, you know. So I did everything I was supposed to do, and... um you know, thankfully, Josh and I actually stayed really good friends. And because of him, he actually really looked out for me and made sure that, like, I never had to go to court. I never had to testify, anything like that. Like, because, again, like, he really kind of went to bat for me with 
the higher ups in the police department and shit like that. Um, and so they basically had ha got all the information they needed. I had this guy on wire and they, yeah, they sent the fucking team out and kicked this fucking guy doors in and found all kinds of shit, guns, all kinds of shit. It was a big fucking deal. Yeah. What? And that, yeah. All that he went away. Yeah. They absolutely. Yeah. He fucking went away. Yeah. <laughs> Like how, what do you went away? Like five years or I, that? I don't know how many years he got, but I remember them. Cause I tried at that point, all I wanted to do was forget about it. Like I did what I was supposed to do. Right. I was a fucking chig, bro. Like, I don't want to know any more about it. You know what I mean? Keep me out of it. And, uh, well, but I remember them. He must've pled guilty. Like he didn't go to trial. You didn't have to testify. So. No, no, he did no. He, yeah, he played, he, whatever they, uh, offer, they gave him or whatever he pleaded, he pled out. So whatever that was, um, I don't know, uh, you know, they mentioned that he definitely went away. I have no idea how many years it was. So, okay. Yeah. So what, um, so then you, you cleaned your life up. You, you went on, you, you went, you went to well, college, you got it. You, you start, you struck, you went straight. You've been straight. No, everything's good. You got no, kids. You're the wife, you're, you're living in a big house and everything's good. Yeah. Right? No, 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 not that even close, a, man. That was a close call. You got out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously said, Hey, this is, this is, this is a catalyst for me to make a change in my life. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, I mean, it sounds good. It sounds really good. You know, and you think, yeah, like you should have learned your fucking lesson. If, instead you thought you thought, yeah. Uh, we thought, yeah, now I see how this shit works. Now I see what these fuckers do to catch people. Right. Okay. I'm going to be able to, I'm yeah. Gonna it, I'm going to do it right. Yeah. And I won't get caught. Exactly. And that didn't work out either, as we'll, we'll hear about. Uh, <laughs> but, so I'm on all these pain pills. I'm still working at Millennium Teleservices. And like I said, again, small town. You know, very small group of people in this telemarketing office. It wasn't long after that till word kind of spread. People were doing whispers, thought that I was the one that did it. Um, you know, that, you know, it took in this guy's father down, whatever. So I was fired not long after that. Uh, did they you, said, did anybody ever mention it to you? Uh, no. I mean, people would say, you know, like, I've heard in conversations, like, oh, I heard that you snitched, you know, whatever. Did you but no one. Did you give him the whole? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Said that. I'm like, well, where's your, I'm like, you got me on tape, bro? And they're, I'm like, did you see a fucking discovery packet? You got me on tape? Well, no. I'm like, well, then I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Yeah. yeah, straight up. Until you show me a piece of paperwork with my name on it, you can get fucked. Yeah. And they didn't have, they didn't, yeah, they didn't have that shit. So, uh, <laughs> um, so they fired me. They claimed that it was because I was deviating from the script. Which is that like an F, like a, a, a FTC violation when you're trying to sell shit over the phone? If you don't read exactly the script, you know whatever, yeah. they can get fined for that shit. So they said that I had uh, deviated from the script. That was their excuse, but we all knew what the reason was. Um, so let's see. That would have been like 2001 or whatever. At this point, I'm still trying to go to college. I'm not really feeling it. I, you know, I, like I said, I'm not, it's hard for me to stay interested in anything. If I get bored with something, like I'm done. And all I wanted to do was go down there and party like that. You know, I'm 20 years old, man. Like I'm not built for school. I'm just not. Right. And so, you know, I, uh, I tried, you know, like I said, best I could. And as I was down there doing that, the pills started to more and more get worse, you know, um, taking more and more than I was prescribed, that kind of thing. And then one day I went to a checkup in Columbus for them to look at my surgery scar and all that kind of stuff. And, um, they, the doctor hands me, you know, this is back when they still gave me paper prescriptions. They just didn't digitally call the shit into the pharmacy. You know, they handed you a script and I remember looking at it and it was for ibuprofen and I'm like, what's this? And he's like, they didn't step me down. There was no taper down fucking process. None of that shit. You know what I mean? Like these, some of these doctors back then should be fucking strung up and shot for the amount of addicts that they created. Cause there was no, no, no thought into that. You know, it was just like, Oh, you've been on these this long. We don't think you need them anymore. Here's some ibuprofen. Right. 
And I'll never forget the next day waking up, man, and being so fucking sick, like a sick that I'd never felt. I had no idea what it was. I'd never been addicted to anything, didn't know what I was feeling. Sick, throwing up, finally figured out that it was because I was out of medication. And so that started, you know, the whole thing where I started doctor shopping and I started going to every local, you know, emergency room around here and, and saying like, oh, I just had cancer surgery. Look at my leg, you know, like, let me get a script, you know, or whatever. And like, it, it worked for a really long time, um, you know, and then as I'm doing that, I'm still kind of selling some of them on the side and I'm no longer working at, uh, you know, millennium. I'm just kind of not working anywhere at all. And, um, you know, obviously I, later on, I had a couple other jobs and stuff, but I've basically been fired from every job I've ever had, <laughs> uh, like legit fired from every job I've ever had. And I've worked, I feel like, uh, you know, the movie Wayne's world where he's like, I've had plenty of Joe jobs, nothing I'd call a career. You know what I mean? <laughs> he's like, I, he's like, I have an extensive collection of name tags and hair nets. You know, like that was me, dude. I'd had, I had plenty of fucking Joe jobs. Everywhere from working at, you know, the big freight company forward air to fucking McDonald's, dude. And from being that to a bartender at Applebee's, I've done it. I've done everything. Didn't work out. <laughs> Just no way now. Right. Uh, so at this point, you know, I happened to run into a friend of mine that I'd grown up with and kind of lost touch with. Uh, his name was Jared. And, uh, you know, at this point, I'm also still kind of talking to Josh, the, the cop that got, you know, that got me at the telemarketing place, but, um, I'm not doing any work for them. Nothing like that. I mean, him and I actually just became friends. So I run into this guy, Jared, and, uh, he is, you know, doing a little bit of cocaine here and there. And, uh, I, you know, at that point I'd never really done coke. You know, that was the worst mistake of my life ever doing it because, I live my whole life as in full tilt or nothing at all. Like, I don't believe in gray area. It's black or it's white. You know what I mean? So right. any, anything I get my hands on, I take it to the fucking nth degree. Cocaine was a bad idea. Right. So first time, I'll never forget the first time I did, like a, a line out of like a $50 bag. I was like, oh, so this is what God looks like. I was like, okay, okay. I, I believe. Amen. Let's go. You know, and so I started hanging out with this guy, Jared, and doing, you know, back then I didn't have a lot of money, so we're just buying a little bit here and there, you know, nothing to write home to mom about. And one night we're hanging out with this girl that I knew um, named uh, Tiffany, and I was also friends with her boyfriend who will become relevant later. Uh, his name was Eric. He's actually dead now, um, but... Eric and Tiffany both had a connect in the city in Columbus, like to get real coke, not like bullshit, local fucking whatever, like real deal, holy field, like bricks, you know what I mean? Of raw, whatever, like it was ridiculous. And, uh, I used to drive this girl, Tiffany, I used to drive her, uh, boyfriend, Eric, every once in a while. And when he needed to make a run to the city to like re up, I would drive him. And of course he would hook me up for driving him and whatever. And so I would take him to his, you know, place to get it and all that kind of stuff. So I'm hanging out with her one night and we're all, you know, it's late and we're looking around for stuff. And she uses my phone to try to call her dealer in, in Columbus to try to get some blow. We were going to make a trip up there. And the guy didn't answer the phone. Well, fast forward a couple of days later, I'm not with Tiffany anymore. Um, I'm hanging out with this guy, Jared. My phone rings, and it's from a number I don't recognize. And uh, I answer the phone, and he's like, yeah, someone tried to call me from this number. And I'm like, oh, I was like, I think Tiffany used my phone. He's like, oh, yeah, who's this? And I told him, and he goes, and I said, I'm Eric's friend. And he's like, uh, are you the guy that drives him all the time that I see out in my parking lot? And I'm like, yeah, bro, that's me. And he's like, oh, well, what would you need? And I'm like, uh, I don't know. I was thinking about maybe getting a quarter or something like that. He's like, just come to the city and hit me up. I like stumbled head first into like a connect. Right. You know what I'm saying? For like legit fucking coke. Like people all the time, the bad problem with addicts is everybody always thinks their story or their 
dope was better than everybody else. Did you ever know that with addicts? Like if you're telling a story to another addict, if you say like, I had two addicts, they're like, oh bro, I had five, you know? Right. Or if you say like, my, my fucking blow was legit. Oh, like, yeah, dude, I know my shit was like, it was the shit. It was yellow as a cigarette filter. Like, fuck off. Like I, this shit was ridiculous. Like you threw, if you would throw a gram of this stuff in a spoon and cook it, it would come back heavier than what you put in there. And I'm talking about with a pinch of soda. Like it would come back like 1.2, 1.3. Like it was, it was just straight butter. It was ridiculous. So he said that to me on the phone and I'm like, looked at Jared. I'm like, we got to get some money together. And so back then, yeah, you could get a quarter ounce for 350 bucks. So off to the city we went, man. And like, I had to drop Jared off because this guy didn't know him. He knew who I was just from seeing me in the car. And remember, I remember going to Morris Road in Columbus and, and to this guy, he was at his girlfriend's house. And just, he said, I'll be walking down the street and just pick me up, pull up next to me and pick me up. Pulled up next to him. He just hopped in the car and just that quick. And all of a sudden now I'm, I've got a, you know, a giant amount of Coke in my fucking hand. So yeah, we started fucking Jared and I selling a little bit here and there to pay for what we were buying. And that kind of snowballed into selling a lot of fucking coke and then doing even more of it. And as I mentioned earlier, I was a terrible drug dealer, man. Like I felt bad for people that didn't have money. I was like, oh, I, I'll hook you up. You know what I mean? Like I just wanted to party and have fun. I was not business minded for that shit. You know what I mean? I would just wanted to get high for free, but I had, where were you living at this point? So, uh, <laughs> I actually had a house that belonged to my, uh, grandmother. And then she actually sold it to my mother. So it was basically like a rental property. And, uh, I was living in, in that and I was paying rent to live there. I wasn't living there for free. Cause when it comes to my mom, she would fucking play about money. Like the fact I'm her son does not matter. You're going to pay money. Right. Um, but it was so funny, man. I, um, uh, you know, I was living in this little house and back then, you know, like, you know, the store hot topic at, at the mall. Yeah. Okay. You remember like you go to hot topic and they would sell like these little neon signs and shit. You ever remember seeing those and stuff? I had one of those pink flamingo neon signs and it was in my window. So basically if the flamingo was lit up, it business was on. That's what the whole point of that fucking sign was. So I had like a pink flamingo lit up in my window. You could see it from the fucking road, dude, in the middle of the night. This is bright pink fucking light shining out of this guy's window. Um, Jared was staying with me basically because, you know, we were just kind of, I let him stay there and we were just, you know, basically doing blow and, and, partying and whatever and little by little you know that quarter ounce turned into buying a half ounce then buying an ounce and then buying three ounces and then you know we were both kind of running our asses off driving like he would we'd split it up he'd deliver to people i'd deliver to people you know on and on and that went on for a long time um and at this point i am completely fucking gone i'm doing you know like six grams or more a day like I weighed like 105 pounds. I weigh 145 right now. And like, I can see my cheekbones. Like if you can imagine me at 105, like I look like walking death. Right. You know what I mean? Where was Josh? Josh at this time had, uh, they had, you know, he had worked with the local police department. Um, he was, he wasn't from our department. That's why they brought him in to work at Millennium Telus. He wasn't a local guy. Right. He was actually from like a county over. He he lived in a, a county over from where I live and um, was working at that police department. So once he was done kind of here in town with what they had him do, he went back to working at his normal, you know, police department. You know, so um, which was in uh, a place called Waverly, Ohio, uh, small town, you know, again, very small kind of place. It's close to a bigger city. But, um, you know, just that's what Josh was doing at the, at the point, but him and I were still in contact. He knew what I was doing, you know what I mean? Um, but he didn't fuck with me about it or turn me in. Like he was no longer responsible for me. You know what I'm saying? So, right. Yeah. His job is done. That's yeah. The problem. Yeah. Pretty much. And so this went on for a long time, bro. And I was strung the fuck out. My parents knew it. 
um, it was heartbreaking. Like I just didn't care about anything. All I cared about was drugs. Uh, you know, I'll never forget being in the city one year, uh, you know, at my dude's house getting, getting dope on Christmas Eve and my mom calling me and being like, look, I just want to see you for Christmas, like crying on the phone. Like, cause they hadn't seen me in months. Cause I just disappeared from them. And, uh, even though I was living in her house, like I would send the rent in the mail, like I knew they'd never saw me. And, um, she was crying on the phone. Like, I know what you're doing. You know, just come here. There won't be any problem. I won't judge you. I just want to see you for Christmas. And that just ripped me in half. You know what I mean? But I couldn't stop. I was so addicted and so, you know, whatever. And so one night, it was like two o'clock in the morning. This is, let's say, this is probably 2000 and I want to say four at this point. Um, I had dope on me. Had no need to re up and go get more. But I thought it was a bright idea to call my dude at like two in the morning. Like, I'm on my way, you know? And so I've been up already for like two days at this point. What, you know, no sleep, just tweak the fuck out. And I'm like, I'm going to drive to Columbus and get some more dope. So I get in the car and go and I'm rolling up through there, man. Got my little plate in the car, doing some lines, listening to music, go up to the city, link up with him, get, uh, what I needed. And, and I really wasn't even getting it that much compared to what I normally got. I, I got a half ounce that night. And, uh, so that was, you know, 500 bucks and so on the way back from his house, I took a wrong exit. I mean, I was high as fuck, dude. And even though I'd been there a million times, I took a wrong exit. And at this point, I was starting to come down. And I was starting to shake and shiver and fucking just, you know what I mean? And I was trying to find a place to pull over to get like a line in me. Uh, so I can come back out of it. And dude, I stopped at this speedway. And of course, I started to get fucking paranoid. And like, I thought everybody was looking at me and I went in the store and then I came out of the store and then fuck it, got back in the car and like I'd bend over to do a lot and I'm like, oh man, there's people looking at me. And so I fucking, I'm a mess at this point. Been up two days, I'm just fucking wrecked. And I pull out of Speedway and as soon as I pull out, there's a red light right here and the light was fucking yellow. I go through the yellow light and as soon as I go through it, there was a paddy wagon cop parked alongside of the fucking curb like watching people, you know what I mean, in this area. They were just sitting there in a van, like a paddy wagon van style, like not a police car. Yeah. And pulled out, you know, hit the switch, fucking lit me up, got behind me, and, like, I was done, dude. As soon as they come up to the car, the guy's like, you've been drinking? And I was like, no, and I'm trying to hold it together. And his partner had walked around the passenger side of the car, and I remember seeing him, his partner out of the my peripheral vision go like this. I was driving a fucking Oldsmobile Laro at the time, a two-door. And his partner pointed, and I turned and looked, and the plate was sticking out from underneath behind the back seat where I tried to shove it under there. And it had fucking coke all over it. And fucking, and like at that point, I was so tired and so fucking just exhausted of being awake that long and stuff. I didn't even put up a fight. I just got out of the car. I put my hands out. You know what I mean? They cuffed me. They searched the fucking car found the dope in the console it was all in one bag it looked like you know a chunk of fucking irish spring soap it was all in one big fucking piece and uh i remember hearing the cops say like yeah i bet i bet you're gonna cut this two or three times and i was like cut it like dude that's what we fucking sell I, what i snort is what i sell i don't cut anything and i never did that's then that's 100 percent true i never cut the dope to try to make more money off of it ever you know what i mean right um, I saw so many people do that and I used to, cause that's the shit that will fuck your guts and everything up when you do cocaine. It's not the coke. It's all the baby lax or creatine or whatever the fuck else they're putting in it. You know what I mean? Uh, I mean, I saw a guy use hairspray one night to fucking, oh yeah. Like he took an ounce of coke, cut it up, put it in a piece of PVC pipe that had a cap on the end of it. Okay. Put it down in the pipe, like a cut off piece of pipe and then put um, sprayed hairspray down in the pipe and then literally used like a uh, like a big C clamp and put the C clamp where the, the top part was down in the pipe and then the bottom part is up against the cap on the bottom of the pipe, tightened it down so it would compress all that with the hairspray in there and hold the coat together. Yeah, I don't know if you're how familiar you are with cocaine, but like Not cocaine 
okay, dude, it's, if you ever get a bag of, of cocaine, like a, a gram or something, and it's all powder in the bag, it's, right. it, you know, it pisses people off. It's garbage. People want to see rocks. Oh, okay. you know, they want to see chunks. And so many people will try to fool you by doing stuff like that, cutting it up with different shit, whatever. What I snorted is what I sold. I never cut it once. It didn't, I just didn't care. I got it for $1,000 an ounce back then and sold it for $100 a gram. You know what I mean? There's 28 grams in a fucking ounce. So do the math. So I made money either way. I didn't need to cut it. But this guy, you know, I got arrested that night. They take me to, um, they take me to fucking first real jail I'd ever been in. I'd been in my local jail a couple times, you know, prior to that for driving things and stuff like that. This was Franklin County Jail in Columbus. This this was a place they called the workhouse. This was what they called it. And, I, you know, it was all black people in there. Yeah, I, I mean, dude, I grew, I grew, you know, the town I grew up in, there are no black people here. There was one African-American kid in my entire graduating high school class. One. There is, then you come here and it's white as far as the eye can see. Okay. All of a sudden, I'm in a fucking, you know, county jail with, like, just black dudes and shit galore. You know, arguing over fucking boxes of nutty buddies and shit. Like, I I slept under a picnic table for three days until a bunk became available. And then I'd been in there about a week until my mom fucking bailed me out. Five grand to fucking bail me out. Why did she wait so long? Just, just probably teach me a lesson. You know what I mean? Yeah, they impounded my fucking car. You know, and what really cr well, I always thought was so funny is they impounded my car, obviously, after I got arrested that night. My cell phone was in the car, which had my dealer's info in it, all these contacts and shit. When I went to pick my car up from the fucking Columbus impound, the phone was still laying in the seat where I left it. They never t they didn't touch anything. They left it all in there. I thought, way to do, you know. So after a week of being in there, she got me an attorney. My, like I said, my mom's been amazing. It's the one person that's never given up on me. Okay, man. So got arrested in Franklin County Workhouse. I get uh, released, you know, from there. My mom bills me out, gets me an attorney. Great attorney, actually. Saved my ass. Um, yeah, he was from Columbus. He's, it wasn't a local attorney where I lived. She got me one from the city where I was at. So I get out, go get my car from impound. And, you know, of course you think that would have, again, stopped me or, or gave me some inkling that maybe I shouldn't be doing this shit. Nope. Uh, your mic got muted. Right. There you go. Because I can hear people outside screaming. Oh, can't, well, bring them, it, bring them in, bring them in. There's, there's you know, so I'm going to mute mine because. Okay. According to you, you're good. Okay. Okay, I just want to make sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, Until they go away. All right, yeah, fuck them. Uh, so, you know, you think that would have deterred me uh, or whatever, but it didn't. Literally, the day I picked my car up from Columbus Impound, I went right back up to my dudes. Uh, like I said, he, you know, my guy was in Columbus, clear up on Cleveland Avenue. Anyone that knows Columbus knows what Cleveland Avenue is. Uh, he, um, he lived in this apartment complex that was right behind a titty bar, a place called Sirens. You know, uh, obviously it wasn't called Sirens Titty Bar, <laughs> just called Sirens. But uh, that's where he was at. So uh, I went right back up there, dude, and, uh, you know, got, got some more. After I got out, got a shower, got my car, whatever, went home. And, of course, I remember calling him, and he's like, where have you been for a week? And I mean, I lied my ass off to him. I was like, oh, dude, my phone got broke. And like, I couldn't get a new phone. And like, you know, da, da, da. he's like, oh, I thought something happened to you, man. Like you got pinched or something. I was like, oh, no, 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 no. And see, I never, what, what I did at, at, you know, the telemarketing place, I wasn't stupid. I wasn't trying to get killed. I wasn't about to fucking ever go do anything like that with this dude. No matter, and they tried. Because I got caught with a fucking half ounce of Coke. I mean, the only thing that saved my ass was it, it was in one bag, so it wasn't intent to sell. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I had digital scales in the car. I had a plate with line cho lines chopped out on it, razor blades, fucking whatever, dude. <laughs> one of my mom's nice Longer Burger fucking plates in the car with, like, just rails of blow on it. Um, but, uh, yeah, they, they tried. And I was like, look, man, 
you guys are fucking crazy. I said, you charge me, whatever. I said, I'm not telling you shit. I was like, I'm not trying to get killed. Oh, we can make sure. I said, you can't make sure of anything, dude. No. And they don't no. care anyway. No, they do not. They'll be your best friend until you give them what you want, man. Con I fucking hate cops. I do. Like I said, Josh is kind of the exception, the guy I mentioned. Uh, and my, and the guy who, you know, was my handler from the local police department. Like I said, Josh was brought in there to, to work this case, but that guy was a good dude as well. His name was Mike. And he actually looked out for me. He really did. Um, which we'll get into some more of that later. But uh, so anyway, went right back up and got more, kept doing what I was doing. Uh, fast forward, you know, maybe about a year later, I'd been to Columbus a couple times going to court, you know, trying to show that I was trying to be, get sober. I, you know, had the X amount of clean urine screens that I had went and took on my own recognizance at that point from like, you know, just to show the judge, um, things like that. And, uh, I happened to be, let's see. So one night <clears throat> we're in town here, local. And I was hanging out with that guy, Eric, that I mentioned earlier that I used to drive for, okay? And so we had kind of been hanging out a little bit. And I, you know, I I had went up earlier in the day and gotten some Coke and stuff. And uh, for whatever reason that day, I thought it would be a good idea to go rent a car. I used to like to rent cars all the time, drive different shit. So I drove all the way to Huntington, West Virginia this day to the airport and rented uh, a fucking Ford Expedition. It's a giant fucking SUV. Why, I don't know. And and I'll never forget that. I don't know why, but... Um, so I had this SUV. I'm out riding around, delivering some shit to people, getting high, just business as usual. And uh, Eric calls me a few hours after I dropped him off, and he's like, hey, man, I got a guy that wants, you know, a, a quarter ounce. He's like, uh, come meet me over such and such. And I had no reason to think there was a problem, you know, whatever. So I go over and meet him. He comes, he gets in the car. I fucking weigh it out right there in the car. Again, got scales in the car. Didn't learn anything, dude. Got digis in the car, the whole thing. Right. And it's not even my car. It's a fucking rental car. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, he goes, let me, he, he, I weigh it out, give it to him. And I probably, after I weighed it out, I, I think I still had somewhere like maybe between six and eight grams left on me, you know, still in the bag. Uh, so I give it to him. He's like, well, I, let me take this over to him and show him. He's like, if, as long as it's, you know, they want to see it first. And like, I thought, okay, whatever. And he's like, then I'll bring you the money back. So he takes off out of the car. And like I said, at this point, I had no reason not to trust him. I mean, I was going to get my shit from the same dude he got his shit from. You know what I'm saying? So about 30 minutes go by and I call him. He doesn't answer. And then about another 10 minutes go by and he calls me back and he's like, Hey man, I wouldn't park down there at that gas station where you met me. He's like, a lot of cops have been driving by there lately. And I thought, that's a fucking weird thing to say. You know what I mean? Like, why would you say that? I can't hear you, buddy. See? You mute it, man. It goes to hell in the handcart. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I was going to say, especially after all that time, like if that was an issue, why did you tell me that when you got out of the car? Or, yeah, or why'd you have me meet you there in the first place if you knew this? Okay. So I'm like, well, that's kind of weird, man. But he goes, he says, um, he says, I'll be there in five minutes. He's like, just be careful. And I'm high. And when you're high, you don't fucking think right anyway. So I swear to God, no sooner than I pulled in back into this gas station. This is probably three o'clock in the morning at this point. No sooner than I pulled back into this gas station and shut the fucking motor off. I was surrounded by the fucking local sheriff's department. This motherfucker, which I can't say anything because, I mean, I I did something. I wore a wire to get myself out of trouble, okay? This motherfucker just didn't want to pay for the dope. So when I gave him the quarter ounce, went back to the house where he was partying at, called the cops on me so they would know where I would be so he didn't have to pay me for it. Literally, I found all this out later from just people and stuff like that. So he basically snitched on me so he could get a free quarter ounce of dope. These fucking drug addicts and I know, you bro. Just can't trust them. No, I know, man. And like I said, I didn't belong there because I was a good for. I felt sorry for people. Like I had no business being a fucking drug addict. Like what? How many drug addicts you know that would give, or how many 
dealers do you know? Not that you're in that world, but anybody watching this will go, bro, you fucking idiot. Like, yeah, I shouldn't have gave a quarter out to fucking blow to someone and been like, sure, take it over to the guy's house and let him look at it. Like, I realize how stupid that is. But I'm not going to lie to you. You know what I mean? You know, you're not, you're not a great, you're not no. a, a good dr a drug dealer. I mean, no, nope. terrible at it. Terrible at it. People would lie to me. I would sell them the fucking gram and they'd be, they'd get, I'd deliver it, drop it off. I'd get halfway back home and they'd be like, oh, I weighed this man. It was like 0. 0.2 fucking light, which I knew better because I weighed it before I left, left the fucking house. They had already taken some out of it. I would feel bad, turn around, go back and give them fucking, here's 0. 0.2. And like stupid shit like that. Because I I fucking stupid. Yeah. I was twenty yeah, it's twenty fucking three years old, man, at this point. So I get surrounded. You were saying about a brand. Yeah. Yeah, it's working well. Yeah. Yeah. I was I was working towards Shark Tank, which didn't fucking exist then. But yeah. Yeah, I was trying to get on with the fuck, you know, Mark Cuban. Um so they were still around the car. Same scenario again. Paraphernalia in the car, but all the dope, I'd taken it out, then weighed it, given him seven grams, which is a quarter ounce. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then uh, put everything back into one bag. So, again, I didn't have a bunch of shit split up in the car, pre-weighed up, ready to sell, whatever. So they surround the car, get me, and again, it's all in one bag. So now we got 14 grams I got caught with in Columbus. And now, if I remember, it was close to eight grams that I got caught with here locally. Okay? So that's a good bit of blow to get caught with. You know what I mean? I mean, it's not, you know, I understand that there's people that have done way more than me that have got caught with way more. But for the small town that I'm from, these are pretty crazy fucking things. Like, people around here just didn't do that kind of shit. Did you tell the cops that you just done been through this? Like I've been through this, fellas. I'm in the middle of this whole thing right now. They, they knew, they knew. Yeah, like I said, this is a small town. Worth, you know, people knew that I'd been arrested in Columbus. People knew that I had been in jail. People like this is not a big place. It, it's it, it's fucking horrible here. I don't recommend it at all to anybody. Not that I'm saying exactly where I'm at, but. I just, it's small town America. It's fucking Mayberry. You know? Like, it's, there's, they, there's they very, they have very little um, patience with drug dealers there. Yes. It's, bad. I mean, bad idea. Yeah, man. Fuck. Bad. Bunch of cock diesel fucking rednecks, they're man. Not, they're not, they're not curtailing their way of life for drug dealers. No. Fucker. No. Yeah. Yeah. And this is back in like 03, man, when, it was just different then. I mean, you, you're you older just like me. You remember how different it was then than it is now. Like, people don't understand. You know, it was just... So, yeah, those, they're just a bunch of redneck motherfuckers with badge. Every cop I've ever met has been a high school bully with a badge. Every one of them. And, and COs in prison. Same thing. You know what I mean? Like, what'd you say, bro? Like, fucking just cock diesel. You know what I mean? Like, that's what... Right. Stupid and big. That's what most of them are. Just corn fed fucking just country boys. Ooh, you know, whatever. <laughs> so they get me. Of course, I get arrested. They take me up to the station. Same thing. And, you know, within a couple hours, I'm in the local jail. And this time, my mom, you know, and like I said, I'm an only child. You know, I don't, not like any of the people I was selling to were going to come bail me out. You know what I mean? Yeah, did but uh, didn't you? But didn't you explain to them? Listen, I've been good to you. Yeah, yeah. You owe you guys really gotta owe me. Well, I I had mentioned that them. time. Remember that time you said I didn't weigh it right, and I had turned around and came back. Yeah, no, no, no. Oh, I thought you meant the police because uh, I mentioned to them. Oh, believe me, I mentioned to them like I've worked with you guys. You know what I mean? Oh, okay. uh, yeah, I meant the drug. I oh your drug dealer buddies bailing you out. Oh yeah, you're, yeah. You're well, neither one, neither one of them gave a fuck. Not the cops or the fucking drug addicts. You know what I mean? I told them like I've worked with you with so and so from this police department. They give no fucks. They don't care. They no, nah. mm. no, nah, they don't care. Uh, so this time local jail and the local jail here. You know, you have all criminals from all walks of life in it. 
you know, county jail is the worst place. I think you can agree. Anybody will agree. You're on lockdown 23 fucking hours a day. Yeah. You know, and they're slipping your fucking dinner through a mail chute in the fucking door. Like, here's your tray. You know what I mean? There's, there's a guy in there for uh, tax evasion, and there's a guy in there for uh, killing two fucking, uh, or uh, two correct, you know, whatever, an FBI agent. Yeah, oh, yeah. There for low level yeah. drugs, and you're like, what am I doing in here with the killer? Yeah. You know, yeah. It's, 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 a, it's a mixed bag. It is, man. And I got lucky because uh, I was in a four-man cell. Most of the cells in, in this jail were two-man. I was in a four-man cell, and it actually had its own phone in the cell. Oh, so it, it, it had its own pay phone in the cell, and there was four bunks instead of two. So there was enough people in one cell to play fucking cards. Right. So you could play euchre, you could whatever. You know, spades, poker, whatever the fuck it was. So this time, my mom lets me sit in there for 45 days. Like, I'm at the, during that whole period, I'm getting to go over to the court, you know, like, to try to get the released on an OR bond. Like, I've been in jail now for a week, then two weeks, then, like, they're not letting me out. She's not bailing me out. Eventually, after about 45 days, I had another court date coming up, and I remember my stepdad got on the phone when I called home to collect one night, and he said, you know, listen, if they don't let you out the next time you go, he's like, we'll, we'll step in and do something. And I was like, so I knew I was going to finally be able to get out. Like, you know, almost, however, almost two months later, you know. Um, yeah, the sunshine. Sorry about that. It's, uh, this house has a lot of windows, unfortunately. Um, so. I hate that sunlight. Yeah, the fucking the just. Ah, like a fucking vampire, bro. Um, even though, and yeah, I also go to the tanning bed, if you can't tell. So fucking cancer. Yeah, this, I'm super smart. I'm so smart. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Actually, I tanned day before yesterday. I don't give a fuck. I don't care. But what about, but what about the vitamin pack? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I figure it, it evens itself out. You know what I mean? Right. That's what I yeah. Thinking. If I stay hydrated, take the vitamins, like I can smoke and tan. Really. I don't fucking care. I don't give a shit. I've made it 42 years. If I'm not dead yet, bro, like, listen, somebody up there is looking out. They have to be, or I'm just, I don't know, but I'm too dumb to die, I guess. Uh, so I finally get out of um, Jackson, you know, I, I, of, uh, what the fuck is saying my name? I finally get out of this jail, and uh, I, um, you know, at this point, not been doing any drugs. I've been in jail. I gained all this fucking weight back. I I looked fucking terrible. I mean, some people would have said I looked good because I wasn't 105 pounds anymore. But I've just been in there eating and fucking, you know, whatever. And so got out, went to court, and then that's when the lawyer from Columbus, they had given me um, basically a court-appointed attorney with this local charge. And then he basically took over both cases and, and got them to run it you know, concurrent, both charges together. Right. You know, so I had to go back to Columbus one more time um, for for that. And the judge, you know, allowed it to be run together and all this stuff and whatever. And then for the local one, um, finally went in front of the, you know, common pleas judge for that. And uh, I'd never been, you know, I'd only been arrested once before, which was the Columbus thing, you know never been in trouble never been in any kind of real whatever i've never had and even to this day i've never had a domestic violence i've never had anything like that i'm not a violent guy I'm just not you know so the judge agreed to let me have what was called treatment in lieu of conviction so if i would have yeah rehab stay on the right path go to probation urine screens you know of course i couldn't do that why would I want to do that? Yeah, that's for suckers. Yeah, quitters. Quitters. Yeah, fucking quitters. Pussies. Uh, this fucking guy, man, this fucking probation officer. I hate this fucking prick to this day, but I got him back, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Years later. I'm 24 at this point, or whatever. This guy, his name was Frank. He's a fucking, you know, not the emperor. No. No, different Frank. Uh, see, I watch your stuff, man. Uh, but different guy and, uh, you know, fucked with me something awful. Hated me. 
because I would piss dirty all the time. Uh, you know, shut up at my fucking house. Just, I mean, raid the fucking house, tear it apart, move the couch, looking for shit, whatever. And at this point, are you saying that he wanted you to abide by the the by your probation? Yeah, that is crazy, right? Yeah. What a dick. I know. These yeah. Guys are the worst. Yeah, I like I don't know what what they think when they read their job title, but like they're just I'm fucking idiots, you know. Like I, you're telling me, that yeah, I can't commit additional crimes and do no on probation. But here's the best, yeah, overkill. Uh, yeah, and here's the best part: the judge had even also implemented house arrest unmonitored, so no ankle monitor. I've been on an ankle monitor for other charges. This time, this was. No ankle monitor. Try going to town to sneak out of your house to go to the grocery store and running into the judge at Kroger's. And he knows you're supposed to be on fucking house arrest. Like, and he just looks at me and says, hello, Mr. Such and such. And I'm like, oh, fuck. You know, you know like, oh, that's happened. Yeah, that's fucking happened. Did that's how some anything of come of it or no he didn't say a word. I mean, he look, the look he gave me was all that needed to be said, but he saw me in there. And then, of course, wasn't like a day or so later. Here's the probation department again at my fucking house. Check it out. You know what I mean? I'm just picking up some bread. Yeah, but I'm picking up some bread. And so that's what I said to him. And I said, I really just, that's what I said to him in the store that night when I ran into I said, I just needed to come and get some food. I kind of put my hands up like this. And he just looked at me. He didn't fucking say anything. And I thought, oh, shit. And then, yeah. So I was probably on probation felony probation and so the ultimate charge that i got was a felony five okay that's what i pled out to because everything was in one bag both times it wasn't intent to sell um i had an addiction problem so uh you know it was uh, a felony five is what i got and so uh trying to do probation and shit i kept pissing dirty and everything man it just didn't fucking work you know what i mean and uh so eventually i kind of got tired of getting violated i got tired of getting thrown in county jail for a fucking week whatever the case was so eventually i went to frank and i said look uh i said man how much time i got on the shelf and i had about a year a little over a year over my head is basically what it was because I had done counting time and like all that stuff, they count all that towards, yeah. And so, um, the, uh, oh, well, I didn't mention that. So the rehab part of the, uh, of the sentence, I got sent to a halfway house. I got thrown out of there. I got caught having a cell phone. Oh. So there's a, there's a fucking halfway house in, uh, and what have a cell phone? No, it was in it was in Lancaster, Ohio. It's called the Community Transition Center. It was right next to a fucking Dollar General. And Did you tell them about white privilege, though. Did you tell them that not until I after? Loud. Yeah, I don't have to follow these rules. Yeah, not until after. Yeah, okay. I, I I should have told them before, but like I thought, you know, I thought they knew at this point. And you have to walk in the door and 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 you have to let them know. Hey, I know yeah. that you guys have some yeah. rules. Yeah, but I was raised upper middle class. Yeah, see, you think, like, you think, it, isn't it funny when you really kind of find out that the rules do apply to you? Because I always thought they didn't apply to me, you know, like, but, yeah. And I've literally told people the rules don't apply to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I used to say, yeah, that's, that, those rules, that doesn't apply to me. That's, yeah. That, yeah, that doesn't apply to me. That no. applies to the little people. Yeah, not me. Yeah, not me. Right. I'm not like, I'm not like you. Yeah. Right. But when, when it does catch up to you and you find out that they do apply to you, it sucks. It sucks <laughs> bad. Be yeah, because th up to this point, you know, I'd always been good at talking and good at whatever, and I'd gotten myself out of a lot of shit. You know what I mean? There were so many times that I did get pulled over and had a ton of dope in the car and got out of them not searching it or, you know, whatever. Like, I, it was almost like I wanted to get caught in a way. I mean, there was, dude, there was one night I was in Colum I was in Columbus staying at a hotel. We were partying up there, and I left to go get dope. And, and on the way back, I'm on 270, which is the main highway there. It's a big four-lane highway. And I, I'm running 103 miles an hour. 
And this is at like four o'clock in the morning, just pitch black, no one on the highway. And there's a fucking Columbus cop setting, like clocking people on the highway. And I ripped past this motherfucker. Now, I told you I was at a hotel, right? It was an Amerihost Inn. Okay, the reason I remember that is because I had a hot tub room and they provided bathrobes. Well, I was driving with that fucking bathrobe on. And a backwards hat with a fucking toothbrush sticking out of the side of it. I looked like a fucking lunatic, dude. I had an Amerihost Inn bathrobe on, backwards hat, toothbrush, and I get pulled over. You would think that would be like immediately the guy wrote me a fucking ticket. It was a $130 speeding ticket and let me go. Didn't even search the car. If he'd have fucking opened the trunk. It was probably close to the end of shift. Yeah. Yeah. But like you times like that, you think, oh, I'm invincible. Yeah. I can't get caught. You know? Yeah. Wrong. So uh, I, I went looking out for me. Yeah. He to smoke this dope. Yeah. It, he yeah. Me to sell this drug. He's looking oh. out for me. Oh, bro. You know, it, I don't know how I'm alive because I've OD'd twice and uh, one time while driving. Like, and if it wasn't for that guy, Eric, that I mentioned that ended up snitching me out, uh, being in the passenger seat and throwing the car into fucking neutral because my foot went flat on the accelerator. And basically punching me in the chest, I would I would have died. I he brought me out of it. He was in the passenger seat and swung his fist like this and hit me in the sternum, and I fucking come up out of it after being awake for like two days, dehydrated, just on straight coke and cigarettes, no food. Yeah, and OD'd while driving like sixty mile an hour. He was able to wrestle the car over to the side of the fucking road. And throw it in neutral and like, yeah, so just, and, but I'm still here. I thought, yeah, of course I thought the rules didn't apply to me. Of course. Uh, so I got thrown out of the halfway house, got taken to the local jail, got released from jail, then, you know, came back to my town and then, you know, more probation, more, you know, more supervision. And then eventually, uh, like I said, I went to him and said, you know, how much time do I have? He told me. I said, just give me everything I got. I said, I can't do this shit. I can't do probation. I said, you know, I just, I, I want to do whatever I've got and be uh, be done with this. I want it passed me, you know? And um, and he agreed, and he also agreed that when I got out, there would be no post-release control. I didn't have to get out and go to a halfway house. You know, I wasn't a violent offender, um, anything like that. And so I went to, uh, you know, first... <laughs> So first I got taken to uh, CRC, which is the Correctional Receiving Center in Columbus, Ohio. And um, there is, uh, you know, where they, they figure out where your institution is going to be and then ride you out to your parent institution from there. Um, so while I'm in CRC, I got put in the medical door because I was, you know, crazy. And, uh, and I, they knew I had mental issues. I had meds and all this shit. Um, so I'm in the medical dorm and the first day I'm up on the top tier, you know, it was like a horseshoe shape and I'm up on the top tier. And, uh, I happened to look down and who do I see that's in jail with me at CRC. Now for people from Ohio, they'll know, they should know. And especially if you're a Ohio state football fan, which if you're from Ohio, most people are. Uh, I was in prison with Maurice Claret, which was the number thir he was he was number thirteen for the high state Buckeyes. This was uh in two thousand and I was in well, I was in CRC in two thousand six. So he would have played for High State in uh oh four, oh five, somewhere in there. And he was a big deal. He got NFL contracts. I mean, he was a hell of a running back. And this guy uh, flipped out one night in Columbus, uh, something to do with his girl or, or something like that. Uh, for those of you who want to know about him, he did an interview with uh, DJ Blad on YouTube. So Maurice Claret is on DJ Blad's channel on YouTube, um, and he explains everything. Uh, but he uh, got caught with an AK-47, a bulletproof vest, I think two nine millimeters, and like a liter of Grey Goose vodka in an Escalade. He was on his way to kill somebody. And he ran from the cops. It was this whole big deal. So for Ohio, it was a big fucking deal. Well, I was in CRC with him. Couldn't have been a cooler dude, man. Signed autographs for me. I mean, this is still back 
pre-iPhone. The first iPhone didn't come out until 2007. So uh, my mo- I called my mom from jail and I said, I'm in here with Maurice Correct. She, she, my mom went to Ohio State to college. She's a huge Ohio State fan. I'm like, print me out uh, some photos of him off the computer and mail them to me in a fucking prison, you know, pre-stamped envelope. And she did. She found a couple of photos of him online, dial up back then, fucking, you know, and all that noise it used to make um, of him diving in the end zone for touchdowns, whatever. She mails him to me, and dude, the, the CEOs let him borrow a Sharpie fucking pen, and he fucking signed him right there on the CEO's desk during rec. And fucking, I put him back in the envelope and mailed him home. So, got my grandma an autograph from Maurice Claret from prison. Yeah. Grandma was cool. She's she's going now, too. Um, You know, I was pretty much raised by her and my mom pretty much nothing but women until my mom got remarried. So, I mean, strong women in my family. Like, I'm very thankful for that. My grandma was a cool lady. Cool, cool lady. Um, So, it was in CRC. And as I mentioned uh, before, you know, they got me on psych meds and shit in there. They had me on Thorazine. I was all fucked up. Just shuffling around and then of course back then you could still smoke in prison thank god and you couldn't smoke in your cell but they sold chewing tobacco on fucking commissary so i i would chew red man chewing tobacco in my cell so i could get nicotine and then going to and from chow was the only time they allowed you to smoke in a straight line they would walk you to and from you know right and um so you could order cigarettes on commissary in there you know whatever And then once I found out what my parent institution was going to be, I, you know, they give you a list of things you can take with you, shit like that. Like you can bring a white, all white pair of Nikes or any all white tennis shoes, things like that. Well, back then you could still bring a carton of cigarettes with you in prison. So I took a a carton of, well, uh, camels with me, camel wides to a prison. And back then they called them Cadillacs. So if you had name brand cigarette, you know, they, you know, basically would say it was a carton of Cadillacs. So I brought a cart and the Cadillacs with me to fucking prison. I was a popular guy, man. So, yeah. Um, so I left CRC and got taken to SCI, which is Southeastern Correctional Institution, um, which is in Lancaster, Ohio, which is also where that halfway house was. And um, so I get in there and I get put into what's called I dorm, which is uh, the way their dorms were at this prison. Everything was like a big airplane hangar. And um, it was just rows of bunk beds, you know, just, I mean, so there was like, and they called them by like street names. So like first street, second street, third street. So I slept on first street right by the fucking payphone bank, which was, I mean, I got a bottom rack though, but it just, you know, right by all the goddamn payphones. Fuck, man. All night long. Just blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's just fucking terrible. You know, until lights... Phone? Yeah, until lights out. I mean, until lights out. Yeah. But you could still, you know, of course, have a TV. They had cable cords. You know, it's a low-security prison. They had cable cords running to each bunk. So at the end of your bunk, there was a stand, and you could buy a clear, see-through, 13-inch color TV off commissary and have a TV at the end of your bunk. That's nuts. Yeah, so I had a fucking TV. It got, you know, all the four channels. And then this prison had a movie channel where you would tune into this certain channel and basically they would play DVDs all day long. They would just swap them out. So the first time I ever saw fucking Talladega Nights, Ricky Bobby, fucking Shake and Bake, was in fucking prison. Because <laughs> they played it on the fucking closed loop inside the prison in there, you know? So I did all my time there in uh i dorm and it was so funny i remember the first day i got there uh you know there was people in there locally from my town that i knew and recognized and i remember this one guy his name's jason he's dead now i mean a lot of people i knew are dead um but jason was one of the biggest just fuck ups been arrested a hundred thousand more times than i ever was like he's lived in the same town as me so you know everybody knew everybody uh, and then I, I get taken to prison the first day I see him, and he's in the fucking honor dorm. Of all people to be in the honor dorm, this fucking guy. Like, it just, if you knew him, if, you know, it's it's kind of a story you had to be there. But if you knew this guy and knew who he was, to see him in the fucking honor dorm was ridiculous. Right. Yeah. So I'll never forget that. 
Uh, but did all my time there, man. And, um, you know, uh, made it through, you know, unscathed. I never had to go to the hole or anything like that, luckily. Um, you know. How long was it again? 13 months. 13 months. Okay. Yep. Yep. 395 days. And uh, I had, that was the total sentence. I had done like 50, I think it was 55 days is what it ended up being in county. So they took that off the, you know, the total. So I spent, you know, 300 and, um, you know, 10 days in prison, basically. And in, in that prison in, you know. Um, so, yeah, but it was 13 months total. Um, but uh, yeah, man, Jesus Christ. So got out of there. And basically had nothing. You know, I got released March 11th of 2007. And I decided then and there I never wanted to go back. You know, now, to just to give you an example, I've been sober 13 years now. And that's legit. No relapse. No fucking nothing. Straight up and down sober. So aside from cigarettes and caffeine, bro, that's it. I don't need drink anymore. Right. Um, so, but when I got out, you know, uh, it's... Um, I fucked up a few times when, you know, when I got out, uh, I didn't get necessarily put back in jail. Cause like, again, I got out and I didn't have any post-release control. I didn't have any, you know, probation, anything like that. You know what I mean? Um, so fucked up a few times, but basically was living with my grandmother and had nothing, no car, no nothing. And, uh, eventually met this girl can, can I ask you a question? What do you mean fucked up? Like you said, you didn't have any relapses, right? Well, no, no, no. I'm. Uh, I mean, now, thirteen years later, I have not had any relapses, anything like that. But when I so, uh, but what you know, because if you add thirteen to two thousand seven, that's that would only be two thousand and twenty. This is twenty twenty three. So there was about a year or so after I got out of prison, maybe where I still went back to the pain pill thing. Right. I never did. I never did coke again. But I went back to the pain pill thing again and started getting into that. And of course, you know, that just, it was just all bad. You know what I mean? Just, and I, I, it was hard, but I eventually got straightened up, got a, you know, cheap car and, um, you know, started to kind of work my way towards just, you know, getting better, you know, that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, again, to fast forward a little bit, as I sent you last night, you know, a lot of people don't get this lucky, but I actually got to get my felony expunged. You know, it took me 20 years, you know, basically to do that. I mean, my original charge was uh, the first time I ever got caught with coke. I was, I think, what, 21, 22. Um, I just got the felony taken off my record April of last year. So, I mean, it took me 20 years to pay off all the fines and all the, you know, get a valid driver's license, valid insurance, stay clean, not relapse, not be arrested for anything else, yada, 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 yada you know, all this stuff. Right. Um, plus, you have to wait 10 years from your original um, sentence date before you can even apply to get the felony taken off your record. You know, your charge has to be 10 years old. You know what I mean? Right. Um, so, but yeah, I hired an attorney, man, last year. And, uh, you know, got to go and, you know, what's so funny is after all this craziness, man, and all this madness and that, and it took that long to get this felony expunged. When I went in front of the judge that day, the original judge that had charged me at the felony court was not even on the bench anymore at this point. You know what I mean? That was 20 years ago. So <clears throat> go into the court. It took two minutes for them to be like, sure, you're not a felon anymore. What? Yeah. I was going to say, they don't, like, on the federal system, they won't do this. A lot of the states will. Yeah, and so it's, when I went into court that day, that was me, my attorney, the judge, and the prosecutor. Okay? And, of course, the I got yelled at by the judge. I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, I thought going to court that day was for a celebratory thing. Like, hey, I'm going for a good reason to get my felony expunged. I don't need to wear a suit and tie. So I wore shorts and a hoodie. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I wore basically something like this and, you know, like fucking sex wire and a fucking pair of shorts and, and, and Adidas slides. And he, uh, he, they presented it to the court. He, you know, said, well, I'm going to go ahead and allow this to go through prosecutor. Do you have any, you know, uh, whatever? And she said, no. 
And so and he says, okay, we're going to allow this to go through. And then he goes, he says my last name and he says, how about next time you don't wear shorts to court? And I was like, oh, your honor, I'm, you know, I'm sorry. I said, I don't plan on there being next time. He goes, well, yeah, how about next time you just don't do it? And I was like, yes, sir. You know what I mean? Fucking skedaddled the fuck out of there. So, um, you know, got my felony expunged, man. Like, again, I've heard you talk about this. You know, I couldn't own a firearm. You know, I couldn't fucking vote. I couldn't have a passport, anything. Now, and with the paperwork that I sent you to you, I mean, did you, you have a chance to look at it? I, I read it. Okay. Um, yeah, now I can, I can do all those things again, man. I mean, I busted ass to do that. You know what I mean? To fucking be, not that I'll ever vote, because who gives a fuck? But I want to own some guns. God damn it. Now, this is America. I'm white. I want some guns. You know what I mean? What the fuck? Yeah, dude. Yeah. Seriously. Um, yeah, I know. I know. I know you. I shouldn't have said um, that, but it's true. Um, um, so th- did you buy, did you go get a gun? Not yet, because, you know, just, uh, I wanted, I, I not wanted to, to I never did get a gun, but, no. you know. Or a passport, or a passport, not yet. I think I, you can actually get a passport, except if you owe fines and stuff. Uh-huh. And they typically don't want to issue you a passport. That's not what they told me. Oh, they said you couldn't? Yeah, they told me that if I wanted to go anywhere, the farthest I could go is Puerto Rico because it's considered part of the United States. Like, if I wanted to go outside the United States before I got the felony expunged, that's a no-go. You could not go get a passport. So you now, may- I have a passport. See, maybe it's in Ohio wall. I don't, you know what I mean? I don't know. Could- I, well, I, I also got permission from my judge to get the passport. There you go. Yeah. Okay. See, that maybe that has something to do with it. I never... Yeah, I never applied. I never even tried to go get one because, I mean, really, I'm not a rich guy. I really don't have a shit ton of extra money to travel a bunch, you know, things like that. But, uh, I mean, I hope to get one one day and be able to actually fucking use it. Yeah. And, um, you know, the gun thing, I honestly have been afraid to walk in there because, you know, they're going to do a background check on you right there. And even though I've got the paperwork, it's just been this little thing in the back of my head like, I mean, you, you know, plan for it, you know. Yeah. You have a couple of days off. Yeah. They yeah. grab you and throw you in jail. You can, you know, keep the paperwork with you. Yeah. Yeah. No shit. I mean, and if expected. Well, it didn't just happen last year as of April. And I asked the, the attorney that I hired, by the way, this whole thing to get it expunged and, and they will allow you. <laughs> to uh, file the paperwork yourself. So if you wanted to try to get your felony expunged uh, and do it yourself without hiring an attorney and paying an attorney, whatever, they won't allow that. It has to be an attorney to go to the court and file the paperwork. That's what they told me anyway. Um, So it was 1,500 bucks for everything. So not bad. No, not bad. No. Um, But yeah, man, uh, it just happened April of last year and I asked him, I said, you know, well, how long does it take for them to get, you know, you guys send out letters to all these FBI, all these different bureaus to scrub my name from their system, all this shit. And he's like, well, we send out the letters. He's like, it's a, you know, required by law that they do it. He's like, I couldn't tell you exactly how long. And I thought it's only been, you know, this April, this upcoming April next month will be a year since I got the felony expunged. And I thought, I'm not trying to get, man. Like, I, like, I wonder if they've all done it, you know? Like shooking my name out of the system. Find out. Well, I'll let you know when I try it after I get fucking handcuffed. I'm calling you. I'm going to be like, Matt, guess where I'm at? I'll be like, yeah, I knew that shit wasn't going to work, bro. Yeah, I'm like, fucking <laughs> hell. Yeah, you'll be like, you'll be like one of the other guys that didn't help bail me out the first time. I'll be like, I don't know what I can do for you. But, it's yeah, man. Yeah, dude. Jesus Christ. Fucking commissary, man. Bro, I got, I was, listen. I was lucky in fucking prison. I I smoke. I basically spent. That's what I spent my money on was was cigarettes. So I I was able to smoke. I, every time we go to commissary, they sold Newports, Marlboros, whatever on commissary at the prison I was in. I would buy seven packs of cigarettes, one for each day, a couple bags of noodles, and then I'd play cards and shit for everything else for a brick of milds or you know black and milds, whatever the fuck you know, or for someone to I'd pay someone to do laundry for me, whatever. But. Yeah, I luckily could smoke in there, man. Because, like, I, I feel sorry for these fuckers now that can't have nicotine in prison. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. It keep, well, it keeps prisoners calm. 
Yeah, I mean, but it's a good thing. You want prisoners to be calm. There's less violence. If you'd allow, if you would allow them to smoke, like I, it makes people happy to be able to go out and have a fucking cigarette. Like, no wonder all these fuckers are on edge. They're taking everything from them except caffeine. Like, you know. So I thought you came down with cancer again in the yes, so, yes. So last year again, um. So just a second. As I smoke a cigarette, to tell you about it. So I roll out of the tanning bed. I'm mm -hmm. looking at a cigarette, and I look down, and there's there's a there's a mole on my leg. Let me see if I can show you. I don't know. It's uh, this fucking camera. So I'm going to go this way with it. No, 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 no. can you see the line? Do you see it? No, it's right here. I believe. Okay, you. okay. There's uh, I, when you and I hang up. Um, actually, what I'll do? Do do medical photos bother you? No. Okay, I'm gonna send you pictures of it because I had the guy was like when he had my had me open, um, removing everything. I told the nurse because I was awake. I was like, take a photo of this shit. So I've got a picture of it. It's gnarly. It looks like someone took a fucking melon baller and just took a scoop out of the side of my neck. So last year I went to the dermatologist um, to get a checkup, whatever, and I had this spot on my neck right here. And uh, it had been there my whole life, kind of like the mole on my leg. And uh, it um, had recently started to like peel a little bit. It was kind of hurt. You know, it never did that before. Because I've always worn like necklaces and stuff and, and it was rubbing against it and it's never bothered me until then. And so uh, they obviously that very day that I went, they, they cut it off and then, you know, cauterized it, did another biopsy on it. So I get a phone call and they're like, you have a tumor in your neck. And I'm like, fuck, man, really? And they're like, yeah. And it's, you know, it's not as bad as it sounds. It's a basal cell carcinoma, but you have a tumor. And I'm like, okay. And so <laughs> go back, you know, uh, it was about a month later, went back and got to actually see the surgeon from that dermatologist's office. And then right there that day, fucking needle pop up 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 all the way around it to numb it you know and and waited about 30 minutes for all that to take hold and then literally man scalpel opened me up cauterized it so it wouldn't bleed and then cut around all the fucking margins in there and um you know and then this guy was a fucking wizard with stitches when i show you the picture it was the size of the hole and what he closed it up to and how now you can't even see it. You know what I mean? Like you can't, you can't see it at all unless you were right up on me. Um, it's amazing how good it, it, it healed. So yeah, I had cancer again and didn't have to do, um, luckily any treatment. Um, this time they managed to get it early enough and get all the margins when they cut it out. You know, I didn't have to go back. So I've had, yeah, I beat cancer twice, man. Emily. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like a cockroach, bro. Like, you know, I just, you can't kill me. Just keep going. Um, so, yeah, the doc, what the doctor say about the smoking and the. Oh, yeah. Oh, of he course. Said, he, keep it up. Yeah. yeah he, he, thing. he said, he said, Mr. Such and Such. He was like, I want you to know that you are the reason that I, that I, you know, do healthcare. He's like, I think there should be more people like you that smoke a pack a day. And tan three times a week. He's like, I want you to spread the word. No, he didn't. Job, say job security. <laughs> yeah. I thought, what do you care, motherfucker? My insurance pays your fucking salary. I don't need a life lesson. He's like, well, if you don't smoke, you'll heal quicker. I thought, I'll take that under advisement. I had a fucking cigarette in my mouth as soon as I walked out in the hospital parking lot where it said no smoking, as a matter of fact. Quitters. I'm not fucking. I'm, it's, whatever. All right. So, yeah. Um, it's been good. Yeah, man. Um, Jesus, you see that? Uh, there's, you know, like you mentioned the other day on the phone, I understand you can edit and cut some of the stuff out. Uh, that day, I think it was just the number one, you know, to go from seeing you on here and then all of a sudden fucking Maddie's on the phone with me. And then I've really had just gotten up. I'm on this horrible schedule, man. I don't go to bed till nine in the morning and I get up around two three two thirty in the afternoon and i'm up all day after that and then around like 11 at night i'll sleep maybe two hours and then i am right back up at about 2 30 in the morning and i'm up all night long until 9 a.m again and it's just 
it's been that way for years now. You know what I'm saying? Um, there's a couple, there's a couple other, uh, you know, really good stories that I'd like to tell you. Um, you know, my ex, the one that, that kind of saved my life, there's a whole story with that. And then I didn't get a chance to tell you about the Mexican girl that I flew here from Mexico that I had never met in person before. Why did you why did you fly her, her in? That's a whole story, bro. You you, you want to hear it? Yeah. Okay. How long okay, ago then, was this? Uh okay, so this would have been after my ex and I broke up. Okay. The one that I after you got out of prison? Yes. And this was after I'd lived at my grandmother's, then I eventually met my she's my ex now, but my uh, you know, a girl, her and I got together. And she really kind of was the lifesaver that got me the rest of the way over the hump and uh got me to get sober. You know, I'm sure you've heard the term sin eater before. This girl was my sin eater. It was so weird to see happen in real time, but this nice, wholesome girl, what she wanted to do with me, I'll never know. But the more her and I were together, it was like all the bad things that I had, all the bad habits, all that shit, slowly came off of me and got put on to her. And she became an addict. She started doing fucking pain pills. She started, you know, and then we had to both be put on Suboxone and, you know, all this kind of crazy shit. It was, it, it was so odd to look back now and, and think about it. because everything that was bad that I needed to quit and move forward from, she kind of took off of me and put on to her. And then after eight years of being together, you know, she had started cheating on me with her ex-husband over Facebook. She wasn't from here. She was from San Antonio, Texas. She had moved here to Ohio to be closer to one of her brothers who lived here and worked here at one of the factories around here. And so I met her through a mutual friend. We got together and basically were inseparable from the night we met. Um, didn't, you know, we got together, went home that night together, and then just she basically never left my side. And we stayed together until eight years later until she left. And when she left, she fucking took everything. We had a truck that was in both of our names so i couldn't report it stolen she took the truck took like some of my clothes took a bunch of furniture and shit i came home to a fucking empty house but it was yeah and she didn't even know that she had been cheating on me i had to find that out through one of our mutual friends because you know she was just i came home and she was gone i had no idea what the fuck was going on and then a mutual friend of ours called me and was like look you know, Tina left. She's not coming back. She's going back to Texas. You know, she told me to call and tell you this, blah, blah, blah. And I'm, I'm like trying to call her phone. She won't pick it up. She was gone. And then find out she had been cheating on me on Facebook for like the last six months with her ex-husband back in Texas. He fucking Western Union her the money to be able to afford to pack up the truck and come back home to him. And she did. When you say cheating on me on Facebook, you mean she'd just been... Uh, communicating with him. Honestly. Well, yes, but making pro, I still consider that cheating. Talking back and forth with your ex-husband, making plans to leave me to go be with him, right. talking, you know, so yeah, I say cheating, but yes. That, okay. Yeah. And then she took um, off. Yes, she took off. And then so, I've always been really good at talking on the phone. You know, if maybe you can't tell from this interview, I've never had a problem talking or, you know, whatever. I've always been really good over the phone. And that's, this will matter in a second. So, a friend of mine, Nick, he was actually my barber, uh, had a uh, flat screen TV. And this is 2000 and what? This would have been like 2009, somewhere around in there, something like that. When, you know, smart TVs were still kind of expensive. They weren't a very normal thing like they are now where you can get one for 200 bucks. Right. So he had, he had a regular flat screen TV, but it was big. It was like, I think it was 55 inch or something, which was still considered big back then. And uh, I had a smart TV, but it was small. It was like 43 inch or something. It was a Vizio. And he's like, I'll trade you this bigger Sanyo smart, you know, flat screen for your smaller TV because it's a smart TV. And I was like, well, I had cable at the house. So I was like, fuck yeah, I'll trade you. I just want a bigger screen. I don't even use the smart TV. Right. So trade it. Well, he had had this TV mounted on his wall. And... When he gave me the TV, it didn't have a base with it, you know, to set it on an entertainment stand or something like that, right? So I thought, well, what the fuck am I going to do with this TV, man? I want to screw holes in the wall. I don't even own this place. I was renting a place, you know, where my ex and I had been living. Um, and I thought, I don't want to screw holes in the wall. 
I'm going to call Sanyo and see if I can get a base for this TV. So I call Sanyo. Now, here's the first thing. Did you know Sanyo is in Tijuana, Mexico? Well, if you ever buy a Sanyo TV, that's where they make that motherfucker is Tijuana, Mexico. That is where Sanyo is, and that's where their call center is. So I call the 1-800 number for Sanyo. They, tra you know, go through the automated bullshit, and they transfer me to the, I guess they would call it the parts in there, or the repair department. They had a name for this department. This girl picks up the phone and says that her name is Meredith. And she's got the thickest Mexican accent, Spanish, whatever, Latino accent that you could imagine. Okay? Like, yeah, my ass, your name's Meredith. Like, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Hello, my name is Tom. Yeah, that, yeah, it, yeah, no, no, it's not, bro. And so I start talking, but she spoke really good English. She just had a thick accent. But she understood perfect. So I start talking to her, explain to her, give her the model number of the TV. And she's like, oh, yeah, I have a base for that. She's like, I'll tell you what. After talking to her for about 30 minutes, she's like, I'm going to send you this base for free. And I'm like, really? She's like, yeah. And I'm like, okay. Sure enough, like 10 days later, I hadn't received anything. So I call her back again. And I'm like, did you send it? She's like, oh, yeah, I sent it out, I swear. So every, because she was the sole person in this department that ordered all the parts and shit. So every time you would call, you would get her. Okay. So I call her back. She's like, yeah, I promise I mailed it. You know what? All this stuff. Sure enough, as I'm on the phone with her, I swear to God, there's a knock at my door. It's the fucking UPS man. It's the fucking base to the TV. As I'm on the phone with her asking like where it is, whatever. Do, do, do. Open the door fucking package on the porch it's the base to this same new tv like so i'm like you won't believe this it just came right now like i'm on the phone with her and she's like oh i'm so glad you got it all this stuff so she was so nice to me for sending me that base from time to time i would call back and just talk to her okay <laughs> just talk to yeah why she was at work okay because i at this point was stuck at home i had no car my ex and i had split up she took the truck I was at home basically all day, every day, had nothing to do, lonely, and I was fucking calling people, man, something to do. And I'm calling this girl in fucking Mexico, because I'm using the 1-800 number for Sanyo, so it's not like I'm dialing direct to Mexico, and uh, talking to her. Come to find out her real name, uh, I'll give you her first name. I couldn't even barely fucking pronounce it. It was uh, like Luedra, or Lu Lue So, but she said, everybody calls me Lu Luli. So that's what I called her, Luli. So I would call back periodically from time to time while talking on the phone while she was at work. Um, turned into her and I emailing each other. Then we emailed photos to one another. So I saw what she looked like. Beautiful girl. About five foot tall. You know, built kind of like a gymnast. Long brown hair. Pretty face. You know, so we start... And then I get her real phone number through the email. So now I'm calling her in Mexico on her cell phone. And we're talking back and forth. This goes on for a couple months. Then, I had an iPad at the time. She did not, but her mom did. So she goes to her mom's house one day. And now she borrows her mom's iPad. And we start video chatting. Now, this is all go over the course of like months. This has all happened from TV base so now I'm video chatting with this girl that works for fucking saying it. Right. Nuts. Okay. And as we keep video chatting and stuff, like I'm telling her about my life, she's telling me about hers, all this kind of shit. And they celebrate pretty much the same holidays that we do in Mexico. Uh, like Veterans Day, like, like stuff like that. They had, that's considered a holiday over there as well. Um, so there was a holiday coming up. Now I can't remember which holiday it was, but she was going to have a long weekend from work. And we had been talking about six months at this point. And I said, look, um, if you'll, I'll cover half your plane ticket. If you'll, if you fly here. Okay. I had to get my mom involved. It was, it, so <laughs> she agrees. So, so she agrees. So as I'm on video chat with her, I grab the phone. We call fucking uh, Delta, book her a plane ticket. It was like 300 and... No, 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 no. Scratch that. That was the rental car. Uh, it was like... It was like... All together, it was like $1,200 or something like that. It was some... Because that's a far flight, dude. You know what I mean? Round trip. And um, I agreed to pay for half of it. 
and uh, she would cover the rental car because I had no car. She knew that, you know. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, so we plan all this out, and the day that she's supposed to fly out, like I'm trying to call her and she's not picking up the phone, and I thought, oh shit, she bailed. You know what I mean? Finally, she picks up the phone. And I did find out later on that she was considering not coming. You know, she was, she was nervous, afraid, whatever. So, but we had been talking back and forth on video chat, almost like you were dating someone. We had talked about maybe, like, I was thinking about maybe moving to Mexico, like, as crazy shit. Because I just, I had nothing else going on in life. I didn't give a fuck. And I had no pass, I had no passport, but obviously, because I'm still a felon at this point back then. But she, you know, you can cross into Mexico, but I just couldn't come back because I had no passport. Yeah, but they're going to let you back. You're in America. Well, yeah, yeah. But um, so the day comes, I'd have my mom take me to fucking Columbus International Airport because I had no way to get there, right? And we're going to rent we rent a car from the airport once once I got there. So all this anticipation, all this shit, right? She had seen me live and in color for months on on video chat. It's not like I was a stranger. She didn't know what I looked like. Right. So fly up there that day. I go to the terminal. I watch the whole fucking plane unload. Nope. And I'm like, so I call her cell phone. She picks it up. I'm like, I'm standing here at the terminal. Where are you? Oh, I already got off the plane. She had gotten off before I even got there. She's like, I'm an enterprise rental car down blah, blah, blah at the end of the fucking thing. So I haul house back through the fucking airport, down to Enterprise Rental Park, turn the corner. How'd you miss her? I don't know. She must have gotten off like right before I had gotten there, and and I just through all the crowd of people walked past her and didn't see her. Like okay. I said, she was five foot tall. You know what right. I mean? Like short little small thing. Uh, so I bust ass back through the airport, get down to where Enterprise is, and it was all like surrounded by glass. You know, I turn the corner. Look through the fucking thing, and there she is standing at the fucking counter at Enterprise. She sees me, I see her. I'm like, you know, run inside, give each other a big fucking hug. She's got a, uh, all she brought with her was a backpack. She brought me authentic Mexican homemade fucking tortillas from Mexico. In a, in a backpack, flew with them. I always thought that was kind of cool. But here's the shitty part. So, my mom sees that, yes, the girl actually, she, my mom stayed this whole time to make sure that I had a, Yes, and that I did. I had a way to get home because we were going to rent a car. So if my mom would have just left, I'd have been stuck at the fucking airport if this girl didn't show up. You know what I mean? Because at the time, I didn't even have a driver's license. Right. So yeah, so I couldn't rent a car. I couldn't anything. So um, why don't we have a driver's license? Because I I just had a ID. I my license had got suspended um for driving under suspension and like uh, just i never got it reinstated and a basically just a lunatic yeah oh yeah 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 i mean like i had had um you could still go online you personally and look up a lot of i've got a if you try to pull up my traffic violation thing online like computer banks at fucking nasa light up beep, 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 beep. like it's they'll just print pages of stop sign and speeding and fucking whatever dude i've had a fuck ton of driving air suspensions and all kinds of shit crazy so what happened the girl so okay so we get the we we get everything done enterprise we go to go outside and we're standing there and i've been waiting months to see this girl in person right and uh we talked about dating all this stuff so as we're standing there waiting for the guys from Enterprise to bring the car up, we'd rented like a, a Dodge Charger, I think it was, or something. Um, uh, no, it was a Camry. Camry. Um, I, I was excited to see her. So like I hugged her again, and I leaned in to kiss her. And she pushes me away and goes, whoa, whoa. And I thought, oh, okay. And I'm like, well, that's kind of weird. And I thought, well, she's been on an airplane all night long. Like, she hadn't brushed her teeth. Maybe that's, maybe she's read about that or something. You know, I don't know. So we get in the car. We leave there. We go to Bob Evans' restaurant to eat because she was hungry on the way home. And she's going to stay at my house, obviously, with me over the weekend and then go back to the airport and, you know, whatever, fly home. So we get to my house first day. We go eat. We're talking back and forth. At this point, I'm still thinking everything's okay. We go to my house, get inside, and again, like, I'm kind of getting her settled, show her the bedroom, all this stuff, you know, um, 
we decided we were going to kind of take a nap. So I kind of get everything together. Uh, she'd been up all night flying. So we get ready to go back there and, and lay down and take a nap. And again, I tried to kiss her again and she stops me again and she goes, I just don't feel anything. And I'm like, excuse me? And she's like, yeah. And she's like, I just don't feel anything. And I'm like, well, how would you know? You haven't even, I'm like, well, you flew all the way here. Like, what the fuck? Right. Yeah. And she's like, and she's like, you know, I just know myself and I just, I know myself and da da da. And you can picture this in a Mexican accent. <laughs> and she's like, I just don't feel anything. And I'm like, I'm fucking pissed. Cause I'm like, I paid half this plane ticket. Like, I thought I was going to get laid, bro. Like, what are you doing? I, I, yeah, I understand. You fucking twat. Like, what are you doing? So, you know, like, I'm so goddamn mad. And she's like, well, we could even have sex. She's like, if you want, but I know that I'm not, I just don't feel anything. And I'm like, I didn't know what to fucking do. Like, I was so upset, dude. And so I kind of just left her take a nap by herself. I did not go to sleep. I went out, called my mom. Like, I'm, I'm upset. I'm talking to her. The more upset I got, the more angry I got, the more angry I got. I was like, okay, I'm not doing this. She wakes up from a nap. And I said, well, you know, I thought about what you said, and I just can't do this either. You need to go. And she kind of just looked at me. Now, she had bought a book from the airport, something to read, right? Like a like a novel, some thick thing from the bookstore. Okay, that that would become relevant in a minute. So I'm like, you just need to go. I said, this is, I can't do this. And she's like, well, I don't have money for a hotel. I'm like, well, I don't know what to tell you. You know, like, I I... Yeah, I can't stay here with you for, well, we could still go out and do stuff together. She was like, we could have fun. We could go, you could show me around your town. I'm like, nah. I'm like, I, I don't want to, no. I'm so mad about spending the money and not getting late. I'm, no. So she leaves after about 30 minutes to our even. She leaves. I have, I'm just freaking out. I'm walking around the house and I look and there's that fucking book that she had bought, right? At the, at the, at the airport. Right. About 20 minutes later, I hear on the fucking door. I opened the door. She came back for the fucking book. For the fucking book she bought at an airport. She came back to pick up. The, she's like, I left my book here. I, I said, here you fucking go, honey. And gave her the book. She left. I don't know where she went. I, I, I don't know if she went back to Columbus. And like, I don't know what. I'd never heard from her again six months of talking to this girl flew here from mexico well she probably slept in the car for two days well but i see the way she acted where she was like i don't feel anything blah 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 and all this kind of shit it almost seemed like to me she had told me before she came that she'd never been to ohio but it almost seemed like she came here for another reason because like she wasn't into that with me but like I don't know. It just seemed like maybe she came here. Maybe she was going to hook up with someone else or meet up with someone else. I don't know. Because, you know, she's Mexican. Whatever. Who knows what the hell she's capable of. You know what I mean? I don't know. Bro, but I, I don't know. I, I don't know how that has anything to do with it. But uh, it's, a, it's a factor, Daddy. <laughs> you know, she's fucking Mexican. She's dangerous. We, we don't know what's happening here. It's fucking madness. So... But she left, and I never spoke to her again. Never heard from her again. I mean, I just I flew a girl here from Mexico on a whim because I was lonely, and she had standards. Yeah, fucking <laughs> again. The rules applied to me. Yeah, the whole shit. Yes, I know. And there's high standards. Yes, but she told me on video chat. Soon as you and I are looking at each other now for months. I didn't change you know, one bit from what I am now to whatever. And she knew what I looked like, knew what I sounded like. I knew what she looked like. She probably swallowed some of those things, some of those, the, the, yeah. the Coke thing. And yeah. Using this as an excuse, she probably went to meet somebody and they, you know, went through her system and she probably made bank. Well, like I said, I'd never heard from her again. I don't know if she slept in a car. I didn't even fucking care at that point. Sometimes those things pop inside their inside them, and they don't get them out enough. And yeah, they die. Well, she'd have died on my team. Yeah, in the woods, in her rented rental car, probably with that book sitting beside her. Probably that fucking book, dude. It was some vampire kind of like Twilight novel or whatever. 
Like, you know, it's understandable that she went back for it. Yeah, and but came back to ask for the fucking book. I was when I opened that fucking door and saw her, and she's like, "I left my book here." Like, I'll get it. Just a second. Like, fuck it. Come on, man. So yeah, it's upsetting. Yeah, bro. Either her say, "Listen, you're not thinking this through." I'm papers. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm potentially, I'm papers. Dude, and I, I asked her about that. After she said, I don't feel anything, I was like, but you and I talked about living together. She's like, well, I think you're a super nice person. She's like, I'd like to see you get, be happy and be get somewhere you're back on track. She's like, I would let you live with me. She actually said that, dude. Like, we, we had a conversation about that, but she just decided at that point after, like, well, no, I'm not into you now. Even though we had talked about all kinds of things, sex and every fucking thing else on video chat for months. You know, women, they're, they're. I know, but how many people you know that started with a phone call and ended up flying a fucking girl here from Mexico? Like, no, nope, not a lot. It's a, it's, just, you know. Just your boy. Yeah, yeah. Fucking winner, winner, chicken dinner, buddy. Uh, yeah, winner. Yeah, I don't know yeah. why it didn't work out. Dude, yeah, and there was a little bit of an age difference. Um, let's see, in two, let's see. Oh, well, I would have been, I think, 30 or something then. I think she was 20 something, oh. so not that big a deal. Yeah, yeah, not that big a deal, but still, you know, but yeah, good old Luli slash Meredith from Sanyo Television Corporation. Yeah, Tijuana, Mexico, Incorporated. Fuck. Listen, listen. Yeah. Yeah. As much as I want to stay on this call. Two hours, I know, bro. I do. <laughs> yeah. I know. I have a dinner date that I didn't make yesterday. I heard you on the live last night, yeah. so you didn't you didn't no. go? No, because it was so she's like, it's so late and we're so right. tired and this and this and you know. So mm -hmm. we, we ended up not going. We ended up what did we eat? Chicken and broccoli. Um what Ooh. Did you oh, where was it? Healthy choice. Yeah, healthy choice. Yeah. Ah, do you know what I had for dinner last night? A cigarette and a red. No. no. No, close. Uh I I enjoy living by myself. You know, there's no one to tell you what to do. So I got a mixing bowl out of the cabinet and ate an entire box of peanut butter captain crunch and a half gallon of milk. Yeah. It was amazing. Where are you? Where, uh Ohio, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, he seemed, you know, the thing about guys like this is they seem cool to hang out with. Dude, I am cool. Because oh, then you realize, like, after a few hours, you're like, oh, this is the maniac. This yeah, but here's, the, here's, let me tell you the kind of person I am. I knew, <laughs> I can tell, I can tell right off the rip if I'm going to get along with somebody, being in all seriousness. And yes, I've always been the kind of person that you either love me or you hate me. There's no in between. And it does usually take people a couple years to get used to me. And then, then they'll be like, oh, well, that's just Jack. You know what I mean? A couple of years. Yeah. Okay. But I'm the most loyal fucker you could ever want as a friend, bro. Like, I, I, I'm I, a good dude. Like, and I, I don't have, you know, a lot of friends and stuff like that. And yes, I am loyal. Fuck that guy that I wore a wire on. Like, <laughs> I was just gonna say, what about that guy? He wasn't my friend. He was my fucking drug dealer. He wasn't my friend. Listen, I'm with you. Yeah, That's the right thing. You just be Josh. Listen, Josh. I still talk to him to this day. The <laughs> He's a cop. Yeah, but I still talk to him to this day. That we're still friends after all of those years. Listen, you did the right thing. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not judging. I know, but I'm on your side. We're but I'm with. You. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that exactly. little. That guy ended up, the, the guy that he, we got his dad, he ended up getting busted for meth later on and all kinds of shit. Yeah, I mean, he's, I don't even know if he's still alive. He's been to prison, I know, I've heard through the grapevine at least a couple times. Honestly, it, you probably saved his life. Maybe. Probably, and you probably saved, he probably, you know, he may have died in two weeks later or something. You probably extended his life, probably helped his dad out. His dad, if he saw you to this day, would probably thank you. Well, I am an angel. <laughs> Jets, you can come say hi before I get off here so like you can at least I can see you. <laughs> God damn it. Stick your fucking head in here. Come here. How you doing, hon? It's good to meet you. You too. 
I'm sure you've been listening to this old madness for two hours. She walked, she's walked in there periodically and shook her head. Did it go all right? She peeks over and looks. She peeks over and looks. Yeah. At you, but you can't. Yeah. 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 Did it go all right, though, man? Yeah, it went good. It went good. Yeah. I think somebody'll get a kick out of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I know that compared to your life yeah. and like both, like Bozy acts and stuff, it was like obviously from the town I'm from, it is a crazy life that I've had. But compared to, you know, yes, you or Boziak or whatever. No, I've, it's not been that crazy. Yeah, you know, you're you're a character, and it's upbeat, and you're upbeat. Mm -hmm. Like, I'll, listen, I'll take somebody upbeat that can tell their story instead, yeah. as opposed to somebody who's monotone and tells this, you know, fantastical, you know, crime story. But they're they're monotone, and you're just like Jesus, bro. Like this is horrible. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. You'll never believe what happened. Oh yeah, no, I'm animated as fuck. I'm like, like yeah. And I the last, yeah, the last right. thing I want to tell you is about the dealer from 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 Columbus. I mentioned you on the phone. This guy lived in these apartments. He was a white boy. Now, I still to this day don't know his real name. He, they, all I ever heard anyone call him was Ziggy. He had two missing front teeth. He had all his other teeth, and they weren't gold or platinum or whatever the fuck, but just two no front teeth. Right. Like, you know, and carried a Glock in his fucking hoodie pocket everywhere he went and had hair standing straight the fuck up on his head, like a messy version of fucking kid and play or something, dude, if you can imagine that. Right. Like, and was a big heavy set guy. And like I told you before, all the fucking guy did was play Soul Calm, Navy Steels on PlayStation. That's right. You told that's that him all he fucking cared about, dude, in life was soul calm. That's it. And smoked Newports like they were fucking going out of style. Like, that's it. And I still, I don't know whatever happened to him, you know, whatever, but like, Ziggy. Like, what the fuck? You know? Maybe you should look him, but you can't look him up. I don't want to look him. No, 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 no. Because when I actually did get busted... He, uh, I owed him a little money at the time. Uh, he was, I was buying from him, but also I'd built such a relationship with him and I'd bought so much that if I needed a front, he'd front me an ounce, whatever, no problem. So not that it's a big amount of money now, but I owed him about a thousand bucks, which, but to a dealer, thousand bucks, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, I remember when I got out of jail, there's a voicemail on my phone for him saying, Hey bro. I hope you don't think I forgot about that $1,000. He's like, you need to get up with me and pay me this money. And, like, I was like, I'm done, dude. Like, I changed my number. Like, I just, I was old. I didn't want no part of that life. Plus, owing him a grand and then going back up to give it to him. Who knows what, because I had owed him for so long. Who knows what he would have done to me. You know what I mean? Well, so, I just. You'd been arrested. He knew you had been arrested. Yes. Yeah. Okay. At that, that time. Right. That he would call you at all. Well, that time, so the time in the Columbus, where the first time I got caught, where the car got impounded, he did not know. I told him that my phone broke, and I right. that's why I hadn't called him for a week. But the second when I got, time. Yes, he fucking heard about it, and I thought, dude, there's no way. You know what I mean? But it was so crazy, man. It, that's you know, all that he would call, even call and say. Yeah, yeah. It was, I mean, I had people in this fucking town buying shit for me that worked at pharmacies around here. I had a girl that would fudge the books and literally trade me unopened bottles, pharmaceutical side bottles of Xanax and fucking yellow Perk 10s, the big giant school bus Percocet. Trade them to me sealed and f for, you know, half ounce of blood, whatever. And then I'd take them up to the city and trade him. Like, it was fucking crazy. It was nuts. So, yeah. All right. All right. I'd love to talk to you again sometime, man. All right. I'd love to talk to you again, though, if you ever need anything. Right. Well, wait a second. Um, I'm going to end recording. Well, mm -hmm. let me let me do this right, real quick. Um, Hey, I appreciate you guys. I'm not even looking at the thing. Sorry. Hey, I appreciate you guys watching. And uh, do me a favor. Uh, check out my Patreon. Also, all of my book links are in the description. And I'm going to put in all the uh, my book trailers. Um, yeah, that's all I can think of, right? Oh, uh, if you like the video, do me a favor, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell so you get notified, share the video, uh, and, uh, leave a comment and, uh, yeah, that's it. I appreciate it. See ya. I'm gonna hold on. Using forgeries and bogus identities. 
Matthew B. Cox, one of the most ingenious con men in history, built America's biggest banks out of millions. Despite numerous encounters with bank security, state, and federal authorities, Cox narrowly, and quite luckily, avoided capture for years. Eventually, he topped the U.S. Secret Service's most wanted list and led the U.S. Marshals, FBI, and Secret Service on a three-year chase while jet-setting around the world with his attractive female accomplices. Cox has been declared one of the most prolific mortgage fraud con artists of all time by CNBC's American Greed. Bloomberg Businessweek called him the mortgage industry's worst nightmare, while Dateline NBC described Cox as a gifted forger and silver-tongued liar. Playboy magazine proclaimed his scam was real estate fraud, and he was the best. Shark in the Housing Pool is Cox's exhilarating first-person account of his stranger-than-fiction story. Available now on Amazon and Audible. Bent is the story of John J. Boziak's phenomenal life of crime. Inked from head to toe, with an addiction to strippers and fast Cadillacs, Boziak was not your typical computer geek. He was, however, one of the most cunning scammers, counterfeiters, identity thieves, and escape artists alive, and a major thorn in the side of the U.S. Secret Service as they fought a war on cybercrime. With a savant-like ability to circumvent banking security and stay one step ahead of law enforcement, Boziak made millions of dollars in the international cyber underworld with the help of the Chinese and the Russians. Then, leaving nothing but a John Doe warrant and a cleaned-out bank account in his wake, he vanished. Boziak's stranger-than-fiction tale of ingenious scams and impossible escapes, of brazen run-ins with the law and secret desires to straighten out and settle down, makes his story a true crime con game that will keep you guessing. Bent, how a homeless teen became one of the cybercrime industry's most prolific counterfeiters. Available now on Amazon and Audible. Buried by the U.S. government and ignored by the national media, this is the story they don't want you to know. When Frank Amadeo met with President George W. Bush at the White House to discuss NATO operations in Afghanistan, no one knew that he'd already embezzled nearly $200 million from the federal government, money he intended to use to bankroll his plan to take over the world. From Amadeo's global headquarters in the shadow of Florida's Disney World, with a nearly inexhaustible supply of the Internal Revenue Service's funds, Amadeo acquired multiple businesses, amassing a mega conglomerate. Driven by his delusions of world conquest, he negotiated the purchase of a squadron of American fighter jets and the controlling interest in a former Soviet ICBM factory. He began working to build the largest private militia on the planet, over one million Africans strong. Simultaneously, Amadeo hired an international black ops force to orchestrate a coup in the Congo while plotting to take over several small Eastern European countries. The most disturbing part of it all is, had the U.S. government not thwarted his plans, he might have just pulled it off. It's insanity. The bizarre, true story of a bipolar megalomaniac's insane plan for total world domination. Available now on Amazon and Audible. Pierre Rossini, in the 1990s, was a 20-something-year-old Los Angeles-based drug trafficker of ecstasy and ice. He and his associates drove luxury European supercars, lived in Beverly Hills penthouses, and dated Playboy models while dodging federal indictments. Then, two FBI officers with the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force entered the picture. Dirty agents willing to fix cases and identify informants. Suddenly, two of Rossini's associates, confidential informants working with federal law enforcement, were murdered. Everyone pointed to Rossini. As his co-defendants prepared for trial, U.S. Attorney Robert Mueller sat down to debrief Rossini at Leavenworth Penitentiary, and another story emerged. A tale of FBI corruption and complicity in murder. You see, Pierre Rossini knew something that no one else knew. The truth. And Robert Mueller and the federal government have been covering it up to this very day. Devil Exposed. A twisted tale of drug trafficking, corruption, and murder in the City of Angels. 
Available on Amazon and Audible. Bailout is a psychological true crime thriller that pits a narcissistic con man against an egotistical pathological liar. Marcus Shrinker, the money manager who attempted to fake his own death during the 2008 financial crisis, is about to be released from prison and he's ready to talk. He's ready to tell you the story no one's heard. Shrinker sits down with true crime writer Matthew B. Cox, a fellow inmate serving time for bank fraud. Shrinker lays out the details. The disgruntled clients who persecuted him for unanticipated market losses, the affair that ruined his marriage, and the treachery of his scorned wife, the woman who framed him for securities fraud, leaving him no choice but to make a bogus distress call and plunge from his multi-million dollar private aircraft in the dead of night. The $11.1 million in life insurance, the missing $1.5 million in gold. The fact is, Shrinker wants you to think he's innocent. The problem is, Cox knows Shrinker's a pathological liar and his story's a fabrication. As Cox subtly coaxes, cajoles, and yes, cons Shrinker into revealing his deceptions, his stranger-than-fiction life of lies slowly unravels. This is the story Shrinker didn't want you to know. Bailout, The Life and Lies of Marcus Shrinker. Available now on Barnes & Noble, Etsy, and Audible. Matthew B. Cox is a con man, incarcerated in the Federal Bureau of Prisons for a variety of bank fraud-related scams. Despite not having a drug problem, Cox inexplicably ends up in the prison's residential drug abuse program, known as RDAP. A drug program in name only, RDAP is an invasive behavior modification therapy specifically designed to correct the cognitive thinking errors associated with criminal behavior. The program is a non-fiction dark comedy which chronicles Cox's side-splitting journey. This first-person account is a fascinating glimpse at the survivor-like atmosphere inside of the government-sponsored rehabilitation unit. While navigating the treachery of his backstabbing peers, Cox simultaneously manipulates prison policies and the bumbling staff every step of the way. The Program How a Con Man Survived the Federal Bureau of Prisons' Cult of RDAP Available now on Amazon and Audible. If you saw anything you like, links to all the books are in the description box.